Hey, good morning, fellow Americans. Good to have you with us today. You know, it's, of course, a very special time of the year. And so we come to you with a very special message today. And let me put it as plain as I can. We need your help. Look, I don't have to tell you how important free speech TV is. You wouldn't be watching if you didn't enjoy it. It's been around for a long time. I'm proud to be the new kid on the block on free speech TV because joining the company of Tom Hartman, Amy Goodman, the good friends at the Ring of Fire, David Pakman, you get on Free Speech TV the kind of unfettered, uncensored, totally independent, unvarnished, hard-hitting news and commentary that you can't find anywhere else. Better than NPR because you can count on Free Speech TV to get your news and commentary from a, a strong, liberal, progressive tradition. But the fact is 
we wouldn't be able to do this without your help. You know, Free Speech TV gets no government funding, no corporate funding. It's all up to you. We depend on you. We work only for you. So we need your help to keep us going. Many of you have already contributed and pledged and supported uh, Free Speech TV for years. We encourage you to renew your pledge at this time. And for those of you just joining Free Speech TV, new to Free Speech TV, join our team by making a generous contribution here at the end of the year. If you can give us $120 a year, that's just uh, 10 bucks a month. We've got a special gift for you, a copy of my latest book, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the uh, Koch brothers and a copy of Joe Cirincione, one of our favorite guests on the show, his latest book, very strong book, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can help us with $240 a year, that's $20 a month, three, co- three books. My three favorite books I read this year, Norm Ornstein's a book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks, this book by Mary Roach, a great little fun book about science. This is Science and Sex, called Bunk, fun book. And then a great mystery novel by Michael Dibden called Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily, where I just got back from vacation. If you can help us with 360 bucks a, a year, that's $30 a month. Three CDs, exclusive interviews that I conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C., available nowhere else. And for those of you who are... Uh, able to do so and feel generous enough to help Free Speech TV with $1,000, a very, very special gift. We will uh, make sure that you get a scarf just like this one, a hand-woven rayon chenille scarf by my wife, Carol Press, who is the best weaver in the world. So those are just incentives for you to join us on Free Speech TV. But again, we're here for you every day, and we ask you here, particularly at the end of the year, take advantage of the tax deduction, we ask you to be here for us. Give a call at 1920s America, the Great Depression effectively erased consumer demand. Struggling manufacturers needed new ways to get people buying again. Innovative production processes like stamping and use of moulds allowed them to use new materials for their designs. Products using vinyl, chrome, aluminium and plywood began appearing. American industrial designers began introducing streamlined efficient shapes that shouted progress. Bel Geddes pioneered what we now refer to as utilitarian art. Things that had little reason to look sleek, now all of a sudden, did. At the 1939 World Fair featuring Bel Geddes' immensely popular Futurama exhibit, a new era of American industrial design proudly claimed to be building the world of tomorrow. Americans found great positivity in these futuristic forms. Things were looking up. American industrial designers realised that by making objects look great, people simply wanted them more. From cars to kitchen appliances, the most influential society on earth was spending money again. Mass consumption had arrived. Advertisers finally had lots to talk about. Personal taste could be expressed through the things you bought. Style became equally as important as function. Chair designers like Eames and Saarinen didn't just design seating, they created desirable lifestyles. People behind the product suddenly were stars. Everyone wanted to know who they were. Raymond Lowy was one of the shining lights of American industrial design. His face ended up on every coffee table in the nation. Toothpaste packaging promised whiter teeth. Washing powder packaging promised whiter whites. Who knew such simple household objects would shape the tastes and ambitions of an entire society? American industrial design improved America, functionally, culturally and intellectually, and exported it around the globe.
broadcasting around the nation on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. The first snow of the season. Well, just little flurries, anyhow, in Washington, D.C., but here we are. Snow can't stop us. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you this morning. It is Monday, December 9. Hope you had a great weekend. Are ready to jump into this whole new week and all the big stories of the week. We'll tell you what's going on here in our nation's capital, around the country, and around the globe. And, of course, give you a chance to get involved in the conversation. Let us know what it all means to you. It is the Bill Press Show coming to you live from our nation's capital and our studio on Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C. And joining us this morning as a friend of Bill for the first couple of hours, a good friend, fellow talk show host, Richard Fowler. Richard, nice to see you this morning. Morning, Bill. Happy hey. Monday to you. All right. Good to see you. Bright and early, huh? Uh-huh. Bright and early this fine, <laughs> wet, icy Monday morning here in Washington. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a combination of um, a little snow flurries and then some sleet and then ended up just cold rain which yes you know i'd rather have the snow than the rain i don't know about you but i tend to agree with that one yeah yeah it's a, <laughs> it, it, it's a mess and of course we can take even the threat of the first snowflake they closed all the schools in montgomery county nearby to get you know, what, <laughs> what a bunch of wusses it's, it's the same way every year right okay right. one snowflake close the schools tomorrow we know it's going to be bad not that bad and our team here uh, for the most part assembled this morning peter ogburn has another day off, um, but uh, Elisa Murphy, our new associate producer. Oh, no, we're not going to say new as of uh, this yes, week. Yes. That's right. I've passed. For, for one week, you get qualified <laughs> as new, and then after that, you're just old, <laughs> just old hat. <laughs> Good morning. Ms. Murphy, nice to see you. Mm-hmm. Stevie Lee Webb is running the board this morning, flying the 747. Hey, Stevie Lee. Good morning. Nice to be here Glad once to, again. I, was, I thought I might be the only one here because I live <laughs> close enough to walk to work, but everybody <laughs> made it in this morning. Alicia Murphy. I'm, I'm sorry, Alicia Cruz. <laughs> oh, there Too many is. Alicias. Alicia, Alicia, <laughs> I'm telling you. It's just Should starting. I change my name to Alicia just to make things easier? <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Cruz is standing by. Take your phone calls. And uh, Cyprian Balding on uh, the video cam, because you can follow us, as you know, not just on your local progressive talk radio station nationwide, wherever you happen to be in this great land of ours, you can also watch us on Free Speech TV. If you've got a satellite dish, it's on the Dish Network or Direct TV. And you can follow our video stream, as people do in 133 countries around the world. How about wow. that? Huh? Impressive. Uh, yes. Uh, at YouTube. I'm, I'm sorry. Talker TV. YouTube.com slash Talker TV. T-A-W-K-R TV. So, Richard, what have you been up to? I haven't seen you in a while. You're still on. Uh, you still have your radio show on we, YouTube, right? We still have our radio show. We are in. Our, How do people find it? I just, um, so you can go to our website www.fowlershow.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel, okay. Fowler, youtubecom slash Fowler Show. Fowler uh, Show. Fowler Show. We're about okay. 19, 20 markets, uh-huh. and um, great. You could always Mm-mm. get us. You get more. Actually, you get. I think you get a better bang for your buck when you subscribe to our YouTube channel because we put more videos out there than we actually. That we and all the stuff we can carry on the show, so that's yeah. how you do it. That's cool. And I so I see you on Fox News popping up on Fox News every once in a yep. while. Yeah, yep. yeah, they yeah. They keep me busy over there. Gotta love them. I know folks don't, but you know, hey, you gotta you gotta be the voice of reason. You know, I always I always reason it this way. People used to give me a lot of a crap when I used to do Fox more often as a guest before they banned me. Uh, <laughs> But I always said, and people would give me a hard time for going on Fox, and I said, listen, if I can go on Fox and be a good, outright, progressive, liberal on Fox News, I get more eyeballs watching me and hearing my point of view than I do on MSNBC or CNN. So why not do it? I might actually, you know, make some converts, get yeah. the word out there. Get some votes. Hey, that's how I look at it. Yeah. So, that's exactly how I look at it. Yeah. Good for you. So we've got a lot to uh, lot to cover today. By the way, last night were the... Um, Kennedy Center Honors, a uh, great big event here in Washington, D.C., as always. The President and First Lady were there. Uh, he uh, saluted, among all the others, uh, winning awards, Billy Joel. For an artist whose songs are sung around the world, but which are thoroughly, wonderfully American, we honor Billy Joel. We announced, he announced uh, we reported last week, Billy Joel has started uh, taking over Madison Square Garden, and he's going to make that his kind of Las Vegas of the East, uh, mm. doing regular shows there once a month, was it? Yeah, and it, uh, the first show kicks off January 27th. January 27th. Mm. And Carlos Santana, another uh, 
Award winner last night. I am a little disappointed that Carlos Santana wore one of his more conservative shirts uh, this evening. Uh, back in the day, you could see those things from space. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was a great night. They had a reception at the White House for the winners of the Kennedy Awards this year as well. So Richard Fowler here is a friend of Bill for the first couple of hours. We'll be talking to Steve Shepard from the National Journal a little bit later in this hour. Uh, the vice president of the National Education Association here to tell us all about today's big day of action. And then Dan Stone from National Geographic, back from his worldwide fact-finding tour, and he'll report into us a little bit later in the program. Nelson Mandela, the president of First Lady, go off to leave for South Africa just about an hour and a half from now to, for the um, first great memorial service honoring Nelson Mandela he was not always so honored, and we'll tell you about some of the conservative uh, reactions to Nelson Mandela over the years when we come back. But first, a few this headlines uh, coming your way today. Press. The U.S. Transportation Safety Administration found a treasure trove at U.S. airports nationwide this past year, finding a half a million in change at airport, ch airport checkpoints. The amount increased by 44,000 from 2011. Currently, TSA has been using the money on itself. However, a new bill passing in Congress called the TSA Loose Change Act would instead use the funds toward building rest and recuperation areas for members of the military throughout airports nationwide. Supporters have had issues implementing the, new, the proposal, with an estimated one million needed to put the bill into action, according to Bloomberg Businessweek. The bill passed the House of Representatives and now heads of the U.S. Senate. Well, so that's a half a million dollars. I don't. Know. People give me a hard time because I will stop and pick up a penny on the street. I don't. Not many people anymore will do that, but I do. <laughs> Loose change. Good and luck. Saved as you a penny might be onto something. But I, I and I've noticed, by the way, as one who kind of looks for change, the Often, I'll see loose money around a TSA checkpoint because people are emptying their pockets and stuff. So think about that. A half a million dollars they found just at TSA checkpoints. you gotta, I, you got to feel sorry for the guy who had to count that. <laughs> no, they have machines that do it now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think they have, I, I don't know, I think this has everything to do with the fact, Bill, that I think TSA just continues to get more, like, more and more scrutiny when you go through these checkpoints. It's just like, you know what, screw it. I just want to get out of here and make my flight. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah. So people don't stop to pick up <laughs> the money, right? I have up. my laptop. That's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> I have my laptop and my shoes, and I'm just going to let everything else go to the wind. Here's what I wonder is, how much money was there that was picked up by people that was not turned in to there TSA? You go. <laughs> mm, that's a good question. <laughs> Big weekend for college football in the Big Ten championship game. Number 10, Michigan State rallied from a seven-point yeah. third-quarter deficit by scoring the final 17 points Saturday night to upset number two, Ohio State, 34-24, mm -hmm. to 24, denying the Buckeyes a chance to play for the BCS National Championship. Ohio State came into the game with the nation's longest winning streak, 24 games. Wow. The team had not lost for two seasons under Urban Meyer, <laughs> having one of the most productive offenses and underrated defenses. For Michigan State, it was a milestone night, winning its 12th game for the first time in school history, completing a perfect conference season, extending its own winning streak to nine, something the team hasn't done since 1966. Wow. You know, I'm not a football fan, but I know that's a big deal. When I saw that last yesterday, I thought, whoa, Ohio State. Mm. Yeah. And a few, uh, few hours before that, Auburn's nerve-wracking, head-shaking 59-42 win against number five, Missouri claiming the Southeastern Conference Championship. So sure. there's huge games this past weekend if you're a college buff. Auburn on a roll, huh? Mm-hmm. Right to that upset of Alabama, or, or that, you know, the whole return thing the last yes. weekend. Yes, yeah. yes. All right, and one more. Hello. A Louisiana extermination company is going to drastic measures with the problem of feral pigs in the Deep South, mm. oh, causing this, yeah. major problems for both farmers and civilians. Louisiana Hog Control uses radio-controlled airplanes, a.k.a. drones, drones. <laughs> equipped with thermal imaging cameras to hunt feral pigs. The owners have killed roughly 300 wild pigs in the last six months alone. Owner of the company, Cy Brown, says anyone can recreate a system, the airplane, computing devices, and camera for about 12 grand. <laughs> <laughs> Since he cannot legally charge people for flying the plane due to FAA regulations, Brown kills pigs for tips, about 25 bucks a porker. 
Ben Gilo, government relations manager of the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, says the industry is poised to take over. With drones being used domestically and abroad, including search and rescue missions, narcotics investigations, and to survey hard-to-reach areas for uh, scientific research, Internationally, the trade group says drones have already been used in a number of unorthodox ways, including to arrest the leader of Mexico's infamous Los Zetas gang, to identify illegal fishermen in Australia, and to monitor radiation at the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan, as well as delivery to your door, as we talked about. Well, that's what Amazon's talking yeah, about. Yeah, I heard, I, heard I heard Domino's was thinking about doing <laughs> pizza deliveries. No, really, no, seriously, really? pizza deliveries to your house with drones. <laughs> I love that, but... Uh, it, it, yeah, but I'll, I'll wait to see that. I, but I, I love the, the, the using them against feral pigs. So <laughs> are we bringing the drones back from Pakistan? Now when we're using them against feral pigs in the South. <laughs> it's too bad Peter's not here for this because this is, this is his territory. The yeah. drones are going to be blowing up the pigs and then selling the bacon to Domino's, which will then be used by more drones to drop garlic bread on you. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Elisa. Yes. So, Richard, this is the week we're going to be... Um, There'll be, you know, nonstop, I think, memorial services around the world, uh, rightfully so, to honor the memory of uh, Nelson Mandela. And it, he wasn't always so honored uh, in this country. I want to get to that in just a minute. But first, I've got to ask you, you know, as a young activist, African-American, what did uh, the example of Nelson Mandela mean to you? Well, yeah, I got to tell you, growing up... Um Nelson Mandela was always this sort of coveted figure. It's almost funny. You hear a lot of, um, in the African-American community especially, hear folks say that, you know, when Barack Obama became president, everyone took in their Nelson Mandela photo that they had on their wall and put up the Obama photo right, instead. Right, right. Um, and I think what, 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 what Nelson Mandela stood for was this ideal that, you know, this whole ideal of people power and people can come together and truly cohesively come together to end racism. And I think he was a continuation of Martin Luther King um, and all those leaders before. Uh, and I think he just gave people hope. Um, especially because both my parents are from a third world country, from the island of Jamaica. The whole like, Nelson Mandela is this whole. It's a, he's a he created hope for folks, uh, and, and I think that's what made his memory so real and so powerful. Um, and it's just and the fact that amongst creating all this hope and being this prolific leader, he was also such a humble guy, um, and just such a totally down to earth, chill person. I was watching. Um, the Op- Oprah Winfrey Network yesterday, I mean, she was talking about Nelson Mandela, and she's saying she remembers Nelson when he came to her show the first time. He asked mm-hmm. her, he's like, what's the show about? Like, the show wasn't about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just, he's a very powerful guy, and being the fact that he's so powerful and has such an influence all across the world, totally humble at the same you, time. The, you talk about as being so down to earth. I remember the first time he came to this country, and I was still doing TV in L.A., and he appeared on Nightline with Ted Koppel. Uh, at some forum in in New York City, and Koppel asked him a question about, you know, this reconciliation of the races and how difficult it was to achieve. And it was the very first question, and Mandela said, he just could have grinned, and he said, well, you know, in South Africa, we always say, uh, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. Right. And the audience just erupted with laughter, and, and also I thought, what a power, what a down to earth, but what a powerful statement, you know, and he just sort of put it out there in terms that everybody could understand. And he had that, he had that way, I think, of himself that he wasn't, uh, he was approachable, if you will. Mm -hmm. People felt they could identify with him. Yeah, and I don't think, you know, this is one of the few, um, you know, deaths, I think, in in history, memorable history, that will go down as more so a celebration of life and not like a a mourning. I think when you think about those type of international deaths that sort of caused the world to pause, like Princess Diana, it was very much more so a sad, mournful event. And even if you look at the coverage Mm -hmm. coming out of South Africa, this is more so a celebration (laughs) of a guy who had a full life, and beyond having a full life, changed the world. Um, and I think uh, folks are celebrating that. Yeah. Um, and so I don't. Even when they the first cap, the first pictures of Winnie came out a couple of days ago, her being at a celebration. And it's more. It's really a celebration of life and less of a mourning of somebody's death. And I think that just speaks to the power that Nelson had across the world. Right. Absolutely. What did Nelson Mandela mean to you? Eight six six fifty five quest is a question. Thanks to our good friends that uh, we we know though that not everybody. Um, respected or admired or supported Nelson Mandela. Let's not forget that over the years. Thanks to our good friends at Think Progress, uh, Igor Volsky and others. They put together a little timeline of conservative reaction over the years to Nelson Mandela. Back in the 1960s, the National Review said that for, for the ANC to take over would result in the 
collapse of civilization. Yeah. I mean, I remember uh, as a young man in California, when I first got there and got involved in, in some political activity, one of the big things I was involved in was the effort to get the United um, University of California to divest in its investments in South Africa because of apartheid. Right. And we were considered total radicals, communists, commie pinkos, right, for taking that position. Uh, at the time, Ronald Reagan, right, opposed um, any sanctions on South Africa, called South Africa a good country, said, after all, this is a country that eliminated the segregation that we once had in our own country. What planet was he living on? <laughs> you know? Right. Very true. On and on. It was Jimmy Carter who imposed sanctions on, on South Africa. Jerry Falwell urged his supporters to support the apartheid regime. And 180 House members opposed, this again from Think Progress, in 1986, 180 House members opposed a non-binding resolution in the House to um, call on South Africa to release Nelson Mandela and to recognize the African National Congress. Dick Cheney is one of those who voted against that resolution, calling the ANC a terrorist organization. Well, I think that speaks volumes to any time you see change, right? And I think there's this, um, there's, these, there's I think it's a two, there's two worldviews. There's one worldview where certain people who have been in power need to stay in power, and they'll do anything to keep power, including stopping those who are fighting for change and fighting for right. more openness and more equality. It happens all the time. I think if you look at what MLK and, and, and Malcolm X was doing, the work that they were doing in the 60s, you saw that same thing. Like, this is, you can't do this. You can't, right. you can't protest. You can't. You know, you can't do boycotts. This is a bad idea. We're going to condemn you with everything we have because, you know, we're completely and totally 100% equal here. Uh, and, and I think this speaks to that. Um, this, these are the same folks who probably voted against MLK, the MLK holiday years ago. Um, and if they had a chance to vote for, vote against it again, they would. Right. Um, and so I think they, that it doesn't surprise me. Right. Um, so as we celebrate the legacy of uh, Nelson Mandela, it's good to remember that there are a lot of forces in this country that did not recognize him then, but probably still don't recognize him today as the great leader that he was. Your take, 866-55-PRESS here on the Bill Press Show, joined by Richard Fowler. Take your calls. We'll come right back here on the Bill Press Show. Connect with the Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, friends and neighbors, a very special message for you this morning. Here we are getting close to the end of the year already. And two things at this time of the year that all of us think about. Number one, taxes. Yeah, if you're like me and Carol, this is when you line up your favorite causes, your favorite organizations. You want to be sure to get those checks sent into them before the end of the year. Number one, uh, because you like supporting good causes, but number two, because you like being able to take advantage of the tax deductions before the end of the year. And when you think about your favorite causes, think Free Speech TV. Look, we depend on it, you know, uh, depend on you. Free Speech TV, as you know, gets no corporate money, no government money. All of our funding comes from our viewers. It's just as simple. We wouldn't be here without your support. So we ask you to Step up to the plate again here at the end of the year. And the other thing, of course, people think about in December are gifts. Gifts to yourself, gift to your friends. We can combine the two for a pledge to Free Speech TV. We'll send you gifts that you can consider end of the year gifts to yourself or someone special to you. Uh, here's how. For $120 bucks pledge, uh, which is 10 bucks a month, think of it that way, Copies of two great books, my latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers and all the evil they're doing, plus a copy of Joe Cirincioni, one of our favorite guests here on the Bill Press Show, Joe Cirincioni's latest book from the Plowshares Fund, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can pledge 240 bucks a month, that's 240 bucks a year, 20 bucks a month. The three of the favorite books that I read this year, one about Congress, Norm Ornstein's It's Worse Than It Looks, this one, my favorite science writer, Mary Roach, and her book called Bunk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. Woohoo! And thirdly, um, my favorite mystery writer, Michael Dibden, writes books about Italy. My favorite is Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily. And then for 360 bucks a month, a real special deal. 
and ex exclusive copies of three interviews that I conducted here at the Hill Center in Washington, D.C., one hour each with Mark Leibovich from the New York Times, Bishop Gene Robinson, and Senator Mary Landrieu. And for those of you who can make a very special pledge to Free Speech TV of $1,000, an extraordinary gift, here it is. Scarf, just like this one, a hand-woven scarf. This is Rayon Chenille. It could also be in bamboo, done by the greatest weaver in the world, my wife, Carol Press. So if you can help us, please, we love bringing you the show every day. I love getting up early in the morning, having the first crack at news and commentary with you, bringing in the best guests that we can get for you. You know, our regulars, Arthur Delaney, Igor Volsky, Congressman Chris Holland, other members of Congress. Uh, but again, we couldn't be here on Free Speech TV. We couldn't be here with Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman, David Fackman, and Ring of Fire without your help. We depend on it. So please give us a call at 877 378 8669. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. giant who embodied the dignity and the courage and the hope and sought uh, to bring about justice not only in South Africa but I think to inspire millions around the world and he did that. Here we go. Uh, Richard Fowler here with us as a friend of Bill uh, on this uh, Monday edition of the uh, of the Bill Press Show and when we come back we will take your calls about uh, what the example of Nelson Mandela means to you, and also whether or not his example might have, uh, and people I think are just hoping that his example might have some, some positive influence on breaking the gridlock in Washington today. Do you think that might really happen? When we come back, we'll get right into it. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, good morning, everybody. What do you say? Nice to see you today. I got to tell you a funny story. So, you know, I was on vacation a week or so ago and uh, met up a, with a couple. Uh, we were chatting over dinner one night, and the guy said to me, So, uh, obviously, you're retired. And I said, What? I'm not retired. I said, What? You think I, because I've got gray hair, I'm retired? No way. I'm not going to retire because I love what I'm doing, and I really do. Look, Having to get up so early to do this show uh, is no fun, but doing the show is something that I just look forward to every single day. I mean, it's great fun uh, getting up, getting on top of the news, having the first crack of the news every day, being able to line up all of our guests, the best guests we can find uh, to bring to you, and then hearing from you all over the country, your calls, your comments on the news of the day, it's just the best job, I think, in the world. And it's especially great, uh, and I especially love now, being able to do this job on Free Speech TV and joining such giants in broadcasting as Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman and the good friends over at uh, Michael Papantonio and the others at Ring of Fire. Uh, and it's all on Free Speech TV, the kind of hard-hitting, independent, uncensored news and commentary that you get nowhere else. That's the value of Free Speech TV. But of course... You know, without any government funding, without any corporate funding, we depend on you to keep us going here at Free Speech TV. We work only for you. And so once again, we turn here at the end of the year to ask for your help, because without your help, we would not be on the air. And now at the end of the year is a good time to do it, because you not only help us and help everybody at Free Speech TV, but you help yourself by getting that good tax deduction. As a little incentive, 
to help us out. A couple things to keep in mind. If you can help us with 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year, we will give you a copy of two great books. My latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers, and Joe Sirincioni, frequent guest here on the Bill Press Show, his latest book, Nuclear Nightmares, a real great book. For uh, 20 bucks a month, 240 bucks a year, we'll give you three of the favorite books that I read this year, all in paperback. Norm Ornstein's book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks. This great little book about science by Mary Roach called Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. And Michael Dibden, great mystery writer. All of his mysteries take place in uh, Sicily, in Italy. One of my favorites is Blood Rain that takes place in Sicily. And for those of you who can uh, offer 360 uh, a year or 30 bucks a month, we'll give you three exclusive one-hour interviews that I've conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C. And beyond that, if you're fortunate enough to be able to help Free Speech with $1,000, you can get one of these beautiful Carol Press scarves. So give us a call. Make your pledge at 877-378-8669. Thank you. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. Earth Justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Here we are now, 34 minutes after the hour, talking about the uh, worldwide reaction and response to the death of Nelson Mandela. Again, President Obama and the First Lady will be leaving the White House at 745 Eastern this morning, just about an hour from now, on their way to South Africa for that first big memorial service of the week, uh, which will be tomorrow, Tuesday, a stadium that holds 94,000 people. Here in studio with us is a friend of Bill uh, this morning, Richard Fowler, from uh, his own Richard Fowler Show. Richard Fowler Show dot <laughs> com, is that it? Yes, Richard Fowler Show dot com. Richard Fowler Show dot com. Uh, Richard, it's interesting. We were talking, uh, and again, take your calls at eight six six fifty fifty five press about the mixed reaction among some conservatives. Um, in, historically, we gave some of the timeline for those who called uh, the ANC and Nelson Mandela a communist, a terrorist. Of course, he was a member of the Communist Party briefly, 
for whatever that meant in South Africa at the time. Uh, but they called him a terrorist, a terrorist organization. Um, yesterday on Fox News Sunday, Rick Santorum talked about what Nelson Mandela meant. And here again, they just can't resist, um, I think, twisting his legacy. Here's Santorum yesterday. But you're right. I mean, what he was advocating for was, was not necessarily the, the right answer, but he was fighting against some, some great injustice. And, and I would make the argument that, you know, we have a great injustice going on right now in this country with, uh, with, with an ever-increasing size of government that is taking over and controlling people's lives. And Obamacare is front and center in that. So Obamacare, he compares to apartheid. I See, mean, will they ever stop, right? I, I, the thing is with Rick Santorum is, is I, I really do believe that he, he really does this to, you know, put himself in the headlines and have us talk about him, right? I mean, I think that's the only way he's sort of relevant, to be honest, because um, really, he doesn't sit in the United States Senate anymore. Um, he had a failed presidential run. He'll probably do it again. Um, and so that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole strategy here. I mean, but that's a bizarre thing to compare the Affordable Care Act, giving 42 million people access to health care. Uh, apartheid, it's a little bizarre. Yeah, and and also... And a stretch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a huge stretch. And given that with with Mandela, um, the new constitution for South Africa, one of the fundamental pillars of it was that everybody in South Africa had a, had a, a born right to universal health care. You know, exactly. That was, a, that was one of the things that he fought for in South Africa, for, for all people, black and white. And so the idea... That something he espoused, we're finally getting close to it in this country, and then he. Com- I mean, it's just crazy. Again, I think Santorum. Yeah, and I right. think that he. I think Santorum also speaks to the bigger, the broader problem with the Republican brand. Um, and I think because there are those Republicans out there who were the ones. I don't know. They're amenable. I guess you'd call them amenable. Um, and he they, he speaks <laughs> to the sort of far right fringe of the party that people are sort of espousing to be the entire Republican party, and everybody gets branded with this far, far, far right label. Um, and it's because of comments like that. But the other thing uh, that we were talking earlier about uh, the impact and the, the power. Uh, it, I, I, when CBS News announced the, uh, the, the night that Mandela died, I was struck by the fact Scott Pelley started off by saying he changed the world. You know, and I was thinking, yeah, he sure did. But how many people could we say that about today in our lifetime? How many people could you say really changed the world? Very right? few. Yeah. Right. Very few. And um, and he impacted so many people, including President Obama, who mentioned his very first. We talked about this last week when he came into the briefing room. His very first political activity. Here's the president. My very first political action. The first thing I ever did that involved an issue or a policy or politics was a protest against apartheid. Yeah. That that's how he got started. Yeah, right. that's huge, and that speaks to that's millions of millions of folks, millions of Americans. That's how they got involved in the political process, um, especially in the minority communities across this country, is fighting against apartheid. One of the things that I was uh, not uh, maybe I'd forgotten or just uh, sort of chose to forget is that unlike Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela one time believed in violence, uh, violent overthrow of. The South African government uh, with it, with it, with the ANC. What does that say to you? The difference between was there no ch- no choice, or did he make the wrong choice, or? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting. I think Martin Luther King was able to take the nonviolent position uh, in the civil rights movement because you had there were folks out there that took the violent mm-hmm. position. You had your Malcolm X mm-hmm. who took a more violent position. Then and so it allowed it allowed Martin Luther King. I think I've, I can't remember where I heard it, but allowed him to sort of be the prosecuting attorney for both the United States as well as the African-American community. Um, whereas in um, uh, Malcolm X only took on the side of the African-American community and I, it allowed Martin Luther King to be more of a unifier. I think in the South Africa case, because Nelson Mandela was sort of the universal leader there, he was he, so he was sort of able to play, I guess, play both sides a little bit. Yeah, I mean, he started as a nonviolent leader and then I, I, met, I, I, I saw, uh, again, I think it was on that CBS report, where he said, you know, we have tried the way of nonviolence, and I've just become convinced that this that uh, that the forces against us are so great that we have to take up arms for for our rights and for our for our freedom. Uh, went to prison because of it. Served, and I think the most remarkable thing that uh, I've heard a lot of people talk about about his life is serving 27 years in prison and then coming out not full of hate, not full of revenge, but 
um, full of hope and determination to stay involved in politics, make a difference, and bring the country together, which he did, which is remarkable. Even invited one of his white prison wardens to his inauguration as president of the of the, of the new South Africa. And I think that speaks volumes to his to the whole the, his whole the whole life. Uh, who his, he really yeah, was, his humility, his courage. His, his true integrity, which is what everybody, I think, looks up to and why he's such a prolific leader and everybody sort of aspires to be a Nelson Mandela type of leader. That beyond all of this, he was able to not only lead the country, not even lead from a, I would say, you, I wouldn't even say partisan, but lead from a sort of, I'm only going to be the president of the black folks in South Africa or be the president of the white folks in South Africa. I'm going to be the president of the entire country, even though, despite the fact that half this country wanted me, had me in jail for 29 years, right. which I think speaks volumes to his leadership um, and why his life, why we, why we are now celebrating his life instead of mourning his death. And how unusual, too, that he uh, served one term as president and then said, I've done it, you know, I brought the country together, and some, uh, somebody else can take over now, and, you know, I'm going uh, to move on. How many people are willing to do that, even but today? But that's the mark of true leadership. I'm, sure. I'm, he, my, my job as a leader is to take us to X or to take us to Y. And once we get to this particular position, I am a strong enough leader to know that it's my turn to step back and allow somebody else to step forward. Touched millions and millions and millions of people around the world, including Helen up in Ithaca, New York, and listening on uh, WNYY, 1670 AM. Hi, Helen. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Bill. I am really, you know, the Republicans are usually more clever than this, but these <laughs> cheap metaphors that are flying around here, like the one you just brought up with Santorum, mm. comparing the health care reform to apartheid, like that. <laughs> All right. And then we had last week, um, we had Rand Paul saying that um, uh, the health care reform is like... Um, uh, putting uh, doctors in slavery that, you know, that you're going to have to go, the doctors are going to be dragged out of their homes and they're going to have to be paid lower uh, fees than they're deserved. And I'm like, so we've got an African-American president and they're using these cheap, stupid metaphors. That, I mean, this is disgusting. Well, it is, and it just shows, I think, the um, the desperation on their part because I think they realize they're part of a losing argument now on, on, the, on the Affordable Care Act, on Obamacare. I mean, it's here, it's here, it's here to stay, and they're on the wrong side of history. And I think more than just the Affordable Care Act, I think they're on the wrong side of history on a lot of issues. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, I think they're on the wrong side of history on immigration. They're on the wrong side of history when it comes to the Employee Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and, and, you know, I think you talk, if you talk to younger voters out there, whether they're Democrat or Republican, most of the issues... On the social issues, they're on the, the folks, our elected officials are just on the wrong side. I mean, you talk to Repub millennial Republicans and millennial Democrats, we all agree with marriage equality. We all agree with employee non-discrimination. Most of us will say, yeah, we need to find a, fix, find a way to fix our broken immigration system. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that clearly that message hasn't translated over to the United States House of Representatives no. or the far right fringe of the United States Senate. And unfortunately, it's that far right fringe that is controlling the day in the United States Congress, which is why it is going to come down uh, this 113th Congress as the least effective and least productive in the history of the Congress. When we come back, Steve Shepard from the National Journal Hotline will join us take, uh, to get his take on the news of the day with me and Richard Fowler here and you on the Bill Press Show. We'll be right back. This is the Bill Press Show. And my fellow Americans, good morning, good morning, good morning. Good to see you again today. You know what? We get a lot of questions I do all the time about, my God, you got three hours to fill every day on Free Speech TV. How do you guys do it? Well, you know, I have to tell you, it's a lot of work, and we're at it like all the time. I mean, we start at the end, right after every show, every day. We sit down for a brief postmortem about that show, what went right, what went wrong. And then we start looking ahead at the next day. What do we think the issues are going to be uh, the next morning? Who are some of the guests we want to talk about those issues? And just sort of do a, like, a rough outline of the show. And then we go on. I go to the White House, um, you know, Peter and uh, Lisa and 
uh, who do most of the work for the for the show. They're looking around all day long at what stories are developing, what guests are available, which guests are not available. Can they come in studio? Do they have to be by phone? We work on it all day long. Uh, and see what pops up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we, Lisa and Peter, put together a tr- what we call a trawl, a whole list of all the stories we might want to talk about the next day. Five o'clock, we have a conference call and uh, sort of firm up the guest and, and get a better idea of the topics. And then we'll work through the evening, you know, again, seeing what develops, watching the news, watching the websites. And then we get here an hour before showtime the next morning and finally put the show together. So you can see it's a whole ongoing thing. It's a lot of work. But here's the key part. We cannot do it at all without your help. And that's why right now at the end of the year, we can get that. you can get that tax deduction. We ask you once again to renew your pledge to Free Speech TV or to make your first one. And uh, give us a call now. Make your pledge at 877-378-8669. If you can give us just 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks, we'll give you two great books, a copy of my latest book, The Obama Hate Machine about the Koch brothers, Joe Sirincioni's book, Nuclear Nightmares, just published. Uh, for 20 bucks a month, 240 buck pledge, we'll give you copies of the three favorite books that I read last year, including a real fun book about science called Science and Sex called Bunk by Mary Roach. For 360 bucks or 30 bucks a month, three CDs of three interviews exclusive that I've conducted at the Hill Center here in Capitol Hill. And if you are flush enough and generous enough to help us, Free Speech TV, with a $1,000 contribution, you will get one of Carol Press's hand-woven, beautiful rayon chenille scarves like the one I am wearing right now. So a lot of incentive for you to help, and we ask you to help as generously as you can. Again, by giving us a call at 877-378-8669. I don't have to tell you how important free speech is. This is a kind of hard-hitting, independent, unvarnished news and commentary you can get nowhere else. But again, we can't do it without your help. YouTube.com slash Talker TV. That's T-A-W-K-R TV. This is The Bill Press Show. On a cold, rainy morning here in our nation's capital, it is The Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live, coast to coast, on your local progressive talk radio station. You can also find us on Free Speech TV, of course, in studio with us as a uh, friend of Bill. This uh, first couple of hours, Richard Fowler uh, from The Richard Fowler Show, richardfowlershow.com. And, uh, Richard, we, uh, on a Monday morning, like to kind of hopscotch across the news of the day with our good friends over at the National Journal Hotline, which has long been one of the greatest sources for uh, the, the news of our nation's capital, both the Congress and the White House. Steve Shepard's executive director of the Hotline, joining us on our news line this morning. Hello, Stephen. Good to talk to you. Good morning, Bill. Good to talk to you. So President Obama and the First Lady, uh, a little less than an hour from now, leaving the White House on their way to this first big memorial service for uh, Nelson uh, Mandela, which um, which will be attended by lots of world leaders uh, and uh, members of the United States Congress, I believe, as well. That's kind of going to dominate the news this week, isn't it? Well, you know? in, in some ways, yes, and it's a diversion. The, the biggest problem with that is, though, that Congress, this is the only week this month that both the House and Senate are scheduled to be in session. The House and, and Eric Kanner have sa- had said previously that they are going to adjourn at week's end, and there's a lot that Congress still has to do. They have to at least extend, if not pass a new farm bill, they have to extend farm bill into January. Otherwise, uh, milk prices and, and other uh, farm policy will revert back to 30s and 40s levels. They have to pass the budget deal. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a lot to accomplish, and only one week when both uh, chambers are going to be in. Not to mention immigration as well, right? Uh, that may end up falling on the back burner <laughs> once again, it, it appears. Uh, the, the budget deal seems to be uh, really taking up most of the oxygen around town. Well, aren't a lot of members of Congress planning on going down either for the Tuesday celebra- celebration or Sunday, next Sunday, the state funeral? Well, that, that's going to be a challenge to get everybody uh, you know, in line and, and enough folks in, in town to vote on some of these issues. And, and we'll see. This may end up extending 
the session a little bit later than than folks had planned. Although you know, usually when that happens, it's because things get stuck. There are filibusters. There are house votes that are put off because the votes aren't aren't there. In this case, I, I think that's something that uh, that leaders in, in both chambers will be accommodating for. Yeah, I I haven't seen any announcement yet about a congressional delegation. Um, I, I'm sure Has that been one, uh, it'll either come in from the Senate or the House. Yeah, I, I haven't seen either, but I'm sure it'll come from uh, the Foreign Relations Committees in in each. Yeah, I've heard, and, and I'm, I'm actually in the process of looking it up now. But I have heard that there will be. I know that the Congressional Black Caucus is planning on selling a, sending a small delegation, but I haven't heard more than that on, on that piece from my lens. But I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, as I, I'm sure there are many, many who would like to be there, but. Well, they could, again, as you indicated, Steve, they could always say, well, due to the events of this week, we're going to have to stay around next week, maybe, and get, God forbid, right, and work another week and get some things done. Right, right, right. And and Eric Hanner had been very adamant, and this was more, I think, a negotiating ploy prior to Mandela's passing, that the House would only, would, would adjourn at the end of this week, and that's sort of a way to get the Senate to uh, play ball with what the House wants now. Obviously, these are exigent circumstances, and that may change plans slightly. If you took the entire list of unfinished items still in front of the Congress, the two, and I think you mentioned both of them, that where we're most likely to see some action, although not for sure, are the budget agreement and the farm bill. Is that correct? Would you? That, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, there are the the budget deal is somewhere where they appear to have struck a very very limited uh, compromise that provides some sequester relief um, and then the farm bill the consequences of not coming to an agreement by the end of the year you know I, folks have reported that it would lead to uh, milk prices around eight dollars a gallon sometime in january so I, I think they're really facing that that tight tight deadline and you know how things work on the hill unless there's a really tight deadline to get something done usually nothing gets done We've seen that over and over again, haven't <laughs> we? We have seen that over and over again. Now, tell me, do you think that there's a possibility on the Senate side that we'll, the, some of the president's nominees will get through um, before they go on recess? Yeah, it's, uh, Senate leaders on the Democratic side are hoping to push those through. People like Mel Watt, who's um, going to lead the Federal Housing Authority, those uh, and some court nominees, uh, I know that they have plans to push those through, and now, obviously, it's a lot easier uh, to get 51 than it is to get 60. So nothing on immigration, nothing on climate change, maybe something on the farm bill. How about unemployment insurance? That may be a part of the budget deal. We're still waiting to see the complete framework, although it is expected that both sides will, both chambers will be able to pass something. The House this week, possibly on Friday, and then the Senate maybe early next week. And that may be part of it, although that complete framework hasn't been released yet. Yeah, wow. Because that's, uh, I think, 1.3 million Americans, oh, yeah. right, who would lose their unemployment insurance if it's not extended by the, uh, by the end of the year. Going to be an interesting week to see how it, uh, how it all unravels. Steve Shepard, thanks again, for, uh, Steve, getting up early for us on a Monday morning. Appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. It's the National Journal, nationaljournal.com, and the hotline. We'll be right back. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, good morning, everybody. What do you say? Nice to see you today. I got to tell you a funny story. So, you know, I was on vacation a week or so ago and uh, met up a, with a couple. Uh, we were chatting over dinner one night, and the guy said to me, So, uh, obviously, you're retired. And I said, What? I'm not retired. I said, What? You think I, because I've got gray hair, I'm retired? No way. I'm not going to retire because I love what I'm doing, and I really do. Look, Having to get up so early to do this show uh, is no fun, but doing the show is something that I just look forward to every single day. I mean, it's great fun uh, getting up, getting on top of the news, having the first crack of the news every day, being able to line up all of our guests, the best guests we can find uh, to bring to you, and then hearing from you all over the country, your calls, your comments on the news of the day. It's just the best job, I think, in the world. And it's especially great 
uh, and I especially love now being able to do this job on Free Speech TV and joining such giants in broadcasting as Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman and the good friends over at uh, Michael Papantonio and the others at Ring of Fire. Uh, and it's all on Free Speech TV, the kind of hard-hitting, independent, uncensored news and commentary that you get nowhere else. That's the value of Free Speech TV. But of course, you know, without any government funding, without any corporate funding, we depend on you to keep us going here at Free Speech TV. We work only for you. And so once again, we turn here at the end of the year to ask for your help, because without your help, we would not be on the air. And now at the end of the year is a good time to do it, because you not only help us and help everybody at Free Speech TV, but you help yourself by getting that good tax deduction. As a little incentive to help us out, a couple things to keep in mind. If you can help us with 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year, we will give you a copy of two great books. My latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers. And Joe Sirincioni, frequent guest here on The Bill Press Show, his latest book, Nuclear Nightmares, a real great book. For uh, 20 bucks a month, 240 bucks a year, we'll give you three of the favorite books that I read this year, all in paperback. Norm Ornstein's book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks. This great little book about science by Mary Roach called Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. And Michael Dibden, great mystery writer. All of his mysteries take place in uh, Sicily. In Italy, one of my favorites is Blood Rain that takes place in Sicily. And for those of you who can uh, offer 360 uh, a year or 30 bucks a month, we'll give you three exclusive one-hour interviews that I've conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C. And beyond that, if you're fortunate enough to be able to help Free Speech with $1,000, you can get one of these beautiful Carol Press scarves. So give us a call. Make your pledge at 877-378-8669. Thank you. This is the Bill Press Show. Okay, in the next hour, we're going to be joined by the vice president of the NEA to talk about the big day of action for American uh, teachers today all across this great land of ours. Also, Dan Stone from the National Geographic, back from his worldwide uh, fact-finding tour, will be here, complete with slides to tell us all about that trip. Richard, Richard Fowler is here, of course, uh, continue as a, uh, a friend of Bill. I was looking at the list of world leaders who are going to be at uh, tomorrow's memorial service for Nelson Mandela, including not only President Obama and the First Lady, but former President George W. Bush, former President Bill Clinton, former President Jimmy Carter from the United States. The United States well represented there at that event. For sure, and this 24 members of Congress. is the Bill Whoa, Show. It. Hey, you- You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Hey, good morning, fellow Americans. Good to have you with us today. You know, it's, of course, a very special time of the year. And so we come to you with a very special message today. And let me put it as plain as I can. We need your help. Look, I don't have to tell you how important free speech TV is. You wouldn't be watching if you didn't enjoy it. It's been around for a long time. I'm proud to be the new kid on the block on free speech TV because joining the company of Tom Hartman, Amy Goodman, the good friends at the 
Ring of Fire, David Pakman. You get on Free Speech TV the kind of unfettered, uncensored, totally independent, unvarnished, hard-hitting news and commentary that you can't find anywhere else. Better than NPR because you can count on Free Speech TV to get your news and commentary from a, a strong, liberal, progressive tradition. But the fact is we wouldn't be able to do this without your help. You know, Free Speech TV gets no government funding, no corporate funding. It's all up to you. We depend on you. We work only for you. So we need your help to keep us going. Many of you have already contributed and pledged and supported uh, Free Speech TV for years. We encourage you to renew your pledge at this time. And for those of you just joining Free Speech TV, new to Free Speech TV, join our team by making a generous contribution here at the end of the year. If you can give us $120 a year, that's just uh, 10 bucks a month. We've got a special gift for you, a copy of my latest book, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the uh, Koch brothers and a copy of Joe Cirincione, one of our favorite guests on the show, his latest book, very strong book, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can help us with $240 a year, that's $20 a month, three, co three books. My three favorite books I read this year, Norm Ornstein's a book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks, this book by Mary Roach, a great little fun book about science. This is Science and Sex, called Bunk, fun book. And then a great mystery novel by Michael Dibden called Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily, where I just got back from vacation. If you can help us with 360 bucks a year, that's $30 a month. Three CDs, exclusive interviews that I conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C., available nowhere else. And for those of you who are... Uh, able to do so and feel generous enough to help Free Speech TV with $1,000, a very, very special gift. We will uh, make sure that you get a scarf just like this one, a hand-woven rayon chenille scarf by my wife, Carol Press, who is the best weaver in the world. So those are just incentives for you to join us on Free Speech TV. But again, we're here for you every day, and we ask you here, particularly at the end of the year, take advantage of the tax deduction, we ask you to be here for us. Give a call at 877-378-8669. In 1920s America, the Great Depression effectively erased consumer demand. Struggling manufacturers needed new ways to get mm. people buying again. Innovative production processes like stamping and use of moulds allowed them to use new materials for their designs. Products using vinyl, chrome, aluminium and plywood began appearing. American industrial designers began introducing streamlined, efficient shapes that shouted progress. Bel Geddes pioneered what we now refer to as utilitarian art. Things that had little reason to look sleek, now all of a sudden, did. At the 1939 World Fair featuring Bel Geddes' immensely popular Futurama exhibit, a new era of American industrial design proudly claimed to be building the world of tomorrow. Americans found great positivity in these futuristic forms. Yay. Things were looking up. American industrial designers realised that by making objects look great, people simply wanted them more. From cars to kitchen appliances, the most influential society on earth was spending money again. Mass consumption had arrived. Advertisers finally had lots to talk about. Personal taste could be expressed through the things you bought. Style became equally as important as function. Chair designers like Eames and Saarinen didn't just design seating, they created desirable lifestyles. People behind the product suddenly were stars. Everyone wanted to know who they were. Raymond Lowy was one of the shining lights of American industrial design. His face ended up on every coffee table in the nation. Toothpaste packaging promised whiter teeth. Washing powder packaging promised whiter whites. Who knew such simple household objects would shape the tastes and ambitions of an entire society? American industrial design improved America, functionally, culturally and intellectually and exported it around the globe.
Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Dangerous conditions out there. Drive carefully. A lot of snow, a lot of ice in most of the country, including here in our nation's capital. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you this morning on a Monday, December 9. Welcome to the program. Welcome to the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live, of course, as always, from our nation's capital bringing you the news of the day and giving you a chance to tell us what it all means to you. Our job is to say what's going on. Your job is to tell us what you think about it and what it means to you, to your family, to your community. Give us a call at 866-55-PRESS. Join us on Twitter at BP Show, and you can send us your comments, uh, your acid comments, as always, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Bill Press Show. We've got a great team of people here uh, to help... um, with the news of the day and with uh, your response to your comments, Richard Fowler is here. Uh, he's got his uh, fellow talk show host, got his own show, The Richard Fowler Show, richardfowlershow.com. Good here morning, as good a friend morning, of Bill. Morning. Hello, hello, hello. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Making it in through the slush this morning. <laughs> Mainly here morning. we had a cold rain to deal yeah. with. Which is, Yesterday we had the snow, and then we got the cold rain, and yeah. now we just have slush and ice falling from the trees. Yeah, a little bit of dusting. Enough snow to even have the... Um, you know. The, Cars were covered. It's going to look kind of nice. Not 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 too bad driving conditions, though. Yeah. And our team here, uh, Peter Ogburn's got another day off. He'll be back tomorrow. Lisa Murphy here, our associate producer. Lisa. Good morning. With Stevie Lee Webb running the board. Yes, sir. Uh, there she is. Alicia Cruz is somewhere. He's in uh, here somewhere. Here, ready to take your <laughs> phone calls. And keeping us looking good on Free Speech TV and on YouTube.com slash Talker TV, Cyprian Balding, our videographer. So, uh, Richard, we were talking just be in the last, or the end of the last hour, about members of Congress who might be going down to the memorial service for um, Nelson Mandela. You've uh, done a little yeah, research there. Got We've your got- answer. So, we have 24 members of Congress going. The the congressional delegation is being led by um, Representative Shock. Um, and that came from the Speaker's office. On top of that, we have a good majority of the Black Caucus, some notable names, John Lewis, John Conyers, Charlie Rangel, Mel Watts, Bobby Scott, Sheila Jackson Lee, um, Gregory Meeks, Barbara Lee, mm-hmm. um, and then on and Senate, and Senate D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. Of course. And on the congressional side, it's Cory Booker. And surprise, surprise, um, also on the Senate side, Representative Ted Cruz from Texas. <laughs> What the hell is Ted <laughs> Cruz doing in this delegation? Hey, and beyond a lot, allegedly, of uh, the far right conservatives are bashing him for praising Nelson Mandela. So, he's bucking the party, I guess. <laughs> yeah, boy, he's, yeah, really reaching out there, man. This is a real, yeah, a real daring move Jesus on Ted take Cruz's the wheel. part. <laughs> All right, well, everybody's welcome to that party. This, in, in the spirit of Nelson Mandela, we will even welcome Ted Cruz to the uh, memorial, hey. to, to we'll the memorial service. All right, hey, coming up, we're going to be joined here at the top of the hour by the vice president of the National Education Association talking about today's big day of action. Daniel Stone from National Geographic joins us a little bit later in the program. But first, big stories of the day. Lisa? Big stories today. Uh, In New York City, taxi drivers are making headlines this week, emulating the New York City Fire Department with their own version of the annual pinup calendar. Freelance writer Phil Kirkman Mm. is the man behind the idea, desiring to capture some of the city's under-celebrated stories. Proceeds will go to University Settlement, which provides support to low-income and immigrant families. The fire department rakes in 150000 annually for fire safety education with their calendar profits. But Kirkman is unsure how many of the $15 cal- calendars they will actually sell. So these are a pin-up calendars of taxi drivers? Yes, That's and they're very creative poses, I've heard. Oh, oh, what's that mean? <laughs> creative poses. That's a euphemism for, <laughs> oh my. Oh my. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. After an engineer's drowsiness caused a derailment last Sunday, killing four people, a New York Post investigation found that dangerous train drivers get little more than a <laughs> slap on the wrist. With reports dating back to 1987, engineer Daniel J. O'Brien missed a stop signal in the Bronx. His engine hurtled off the rails and crashed into an incoming train filled with 500 commuters. 27 were hurt. He was fired, but 12 years later, the railroad hired him back. William Rockefeller, who's responsible for last Sunday's derailment, has been suspended without pay while the accident is investigated. Bronx prosecutors are weighing criminal charges. 
Yeah, you would think one accident like that, and you'd be done, right? I, I agree. would think so. Yeah, not hired back. Mm -hmm. I agree there. A runner experienced a rare Rudolph sighting last week. Oh, Christine yeah. Rivera was jogging on a path near Claiborne Parkway in Ashburn near Dulles Greenway when a 71-year-old woman from South Riding driving a Toyota SUV struck a deer, sending the animal flying into Rivera. Whoa. She only remembers running one minute and then waking up in an ambulance the next. Unfortunately, the buck Whoa. died at the scene. The driver was treated for minor injuries. Rivera suffered a concussion, a cut to her scalp, and a bruised knee. Barely five feet tall, Rivera friends have always jokingly called her the Hulk. And now she says, I guess they really can. Wow. So the oh. car hit the deer, the deer flies through the air and, and hits, hits Rivera, the run runner, her. and she ends up in the hospital. Yes. With <laughs> with not that, I mean, her injuries are very minor. And on Dasher, on Dancer, on <laughs> Don... Ow! Here comes <laughs> Rivera. <laughs> Winter Wonderland, indeed. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alicia. Yes, indeed, it's a big day for American schools and getting the message out about American education. Many, many different organizations, including the National Education Association, are sponsoring today's Day of Action. The vice president of the NEA joins us on our news line this morning, Lily Escalin Garcia. Lily, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Congratulations. Good to have you back on the program. Oh, it's good to be here, and it's an important day. Yeah, so tell us what's up today around the country, where and when, and what's going on. You know, I think what makes today different, because... We, you know, we're, we're educators, we're organized, uh, we are constantly out there fighting for our students, for affordable college, for preschool, for an end to reducing education to what will fit on a little multiple choice bubble test. Um, <laughs> but today we are joining hands with community activists all across the country in over a hundred different cities. And I think what, um, what you're going to see is that educators and um, advocates for the poor and uh, people who really care about health care and safety and and the environment um, everybody is so fed up with what we're seeing as that growing gap between the haves and the have-nots and the middle class is so quickly as you know slip down into the poor um, as quickly as we can. And we deal with public schools. That's really where we educate most of our kids. That's where the middle class sends their kids to go to school. But we want to show folks who are fighting for families that we are on their side, they are on our side, and we have to join hands against uh, what we see as the corporate takeover um, of our country, of everything that has the word public in front of it. So you've got uh, parents and business leaders, community leaders, teachers, administrators all gathering together. What kind of events are planned, Lily? You know, I just got back from Texas uh, and uh, got out just before they closed uh, all the airports down. Good for uh, you. And yeah. I, was, I was at an event, uh, as, as I said, we have folks that have organized events in over 100 City. Some mm -hmm. of them for today, some of them happened over the weekend. And in Austin, uh, the, the teachers' unions in Austin, uh, the Texas State Teachers Association, the NEA, we sponsored a rally up on the Capitol in that sub-freezing weather out there uh, that, that hit us so hard. And we were standing next to people who are fighting for immigration reform, fighting for the DREAM Act, fighting for health care for poor kids, uh, people who were just fighting to get people fed. And it was so heartwarming, hundreds and hundreds of people with icicles hanging from our nostrils, <laughs> uh, just, just uh, shouting to the state capitol, uh, to legislators, to let people have the services that um, that would make those families strong, that would make those kids uh, have the opportunity to make their dreams come true. And, of course, when you have rallies like that, usually the people inside the buildings just close the windows so they don't hear you. But the press picks it up. Uh, radio shows like yours will will give some airtime to to these kinds of issues. We had a lot of cameras there who interviewed those amazing uh, uh, protesters standing out in the cold. And 
folks are starting to wake up. They're starting to say, this isn't right, and they want to take action. You know what gets me is I just don't understand why support for public schools has become such a partisan football. To me, I mean, to me, it should not be. I mean, it's something that we should all rally behind and all support and all want our public schools to be the best in the world. You know what I mean? You know, I I don't want to sound alarmist, but I will because <laughs> I'm alarmed. <laughs> but, I mean, I've had people who've, who've said, you know, Public schools are public. There might be a few little corporate charter schools or voucher programs, but really our public schools are, are still pretty mm-hmm. public. Well, there's, there's that word, still. I remember 30 years ago, would you have ever thought we would have had a private prison chain? No. Nobody, nobody <laughs> saw yeah. that. I, I mean, I remember when we had public utilities. <laughs> Everything that has the word public in front of it now, there's somebody out there, you know, just kind of rubbing their hands together, uh, saying, how am I going to make some money off of this? And how do I get public dollars into my pocket? And there are more and more people now that have figured out, if I can get the public to forget about public schools, not want to support public schools, think that all public schools are bad or that public school teachers are scary, uh, then maybe I can build my private school chain and get public dollars to do that. I honestly believe that there is, uh, that there are plenty of people out there that would love to see that happening. Most parents, most community members want a good public school in their neighborhood. They want every child to have access to a yeah. good public school. I, I completely, and that's what we want. I completely agree with you. Now tell me, uh, as you guys are sort of having this rally, is, are, is, there a connect, is there a connectivity between public education and our national security and economic interests for the country? I think because folks don't really see that connection, but I think it's definitely there. You know, we've, we're usually everybody's favorite charity. You know, I, I taught elementary school in Utah for 20 years, and people would, you know, like, well, let's give something to those cute kids. Uh, yeah, my kids were really cute. They are also the economic backbone of this country. They are everything we hope to accomplish with our Uh, with the United States and globally, how we are educating children to be critical thinkers, to be creative problem solvers, to work as partners, to be good members of society that really are compassionate people who care about the world and uh, around them. Uh, that's that's what the purpose of public schools are. I'm still fighting politicians on both sides of the aisle, might I add, who still think the purpose of education is to hit a cut score on some commercial standardized test. I know that the purpose of education is to open a child's mind to its infinite possibilities, and and that's what this country is going to be built on. Yep. Um, so when you start messing with our public schools, you are messing with this country's future. Yeah. You know, we've been talking, of course, a lot about Nelson Mandela the last, uh, the last few days, and I saw where Mandela once said that education, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, I think we have just about right, education is the greatest force, the greatest weapon, I think he used, for changing the world. You know, it, it, you're, it, you're, you're, you've got it almost nailed, because that, that is exactly what he said, and he's exactly right. I remember listening to a, an interview with a South African um, a freedom fighter, a black teacher, uh, from Soweto, uh, who was asked, how can you do what you do every day? You, you teach in these miserable conditions, and then, and then you go home and you are part of the anti-apartheid fight. And she said, you need three things. You need to be a little crazy. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be willing to drive other people crazy. Mm. And you need to never be afraid. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this day of action is all about, driving people crazy <laughs> and, and doing it fearlessly, doing it with pride and standing side by side, shoulder to shoulder with other people who understand what that school means, especially to children. Okay, well, I want to jump in. In the, in the gap. Let me jump in. For, for people uh, listening, people watching around the country, 
uh, who want to know where these events are taking place or how they can plug in, even if this is not something in their community, how can they find out about it? The, the, go, today's day of action. Go to educationvotes.nea and you will be able to uh, link into uh, if there is an event in your area or how you can sign petitions and you can let Congress and, know th- and let other politicians know that you demand the right things happen with our public schools as that center um, of, of our, our heart and soul in this country. Okay, educationvotes.nea.org, right? That's it. You got it. All right. Lily, thanks so much for your time this morning. Great to talk to you again, and congratulations on a big day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Lily Escalin Garcia is vice president of the National Education Association, uh, working there with Dennis Van Rokel. Also happened to be a sponsor of the Bill Press Show, for which we are, of course, very grateful. We'll be back with Richard Fowler and you at 866-55-PRESS. Be on your radio, on TV, and online. This is The Bill Press Show. Hey, friends and neighbors, a very special message for you this morning. Here we are, getting close to the end of the year already, and two things at this time of the year that all of us think about. Number one, taxes. Yeah, if you're like me and Carol, this is when you line up your favorite causes, your favorite organizations. You want to be sure to get those checks sent them into them before the end of the year. Number one, uh, because you like supporting good causes, but number two, because you like being able to take advantage of the tax deductions before the end of the year. And when you think about your favorite causes, think Free Speech TV. Look, we depend on it, you know, uh, depend on you. Free Speech TV, as you know, gets no corporate money, no government money. All of our funding comes from our viewers. It's just as simple. We wouldn't be here without your support. So we ask you to step up to the plate again here at the end of the year. And the other thing, of course, people think about in December are gifts. Gifts to yourself, gifts to your friends. We can combine the two. For a pledge to Free Speech TV, we'll send you gifts that you can consider end-of-the-year gifts to yourself or someone special to you. Uh, here's how. For a $120 pledge, uh, which is 10 bucks a month, think of it that way, copies of two great books, my latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers and all the evil they're doing, plus a copy of Joe Cirincione, one of our favorite guests here on the Bill Press Show, Joe Cirincione's latest book from the Plowshares Fund, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can pledge 240 bucks a month, that's 240 bucks a year, 20 bucks a month. The three of the favorite books that I read this year, one about Congress, Norm Ornstein's It's Worse Than It Looks. This one, my favorite science writer, Mary Roach, and her book called Bunk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. Woohoo! And thirdly, um, my favorite mystery writer, Michael Dibden. Writes books about Italy. My favorite is Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily. And then for 360 bucks a month, a real special deal. And ex- exclusive copies of three interviews that I conducted here at the Hill Center in Washington, D.C., one hour each with Mark Leibovich from the New York Times, Bishop Gene Robinson, and Senator Mary Landrieu. And for those of you who can make a very special pledge to Free Speech TV of $1,000, an extraordinary gift, here it is. Scarf, just like this one, a hand woven scarf. This is Rayon Chenille. It could also be in bamboo, done by the greatest weaver in the world, my wife, Carol Press. So if you can help us, please, we love bringing you the show every day. I love getting up early in the morning, having the first crack at news and commentary with you, bringing in the best guests that we can get for you. You know, our regulars, Arthur Delaney, Igor Volsky, Congressman Chris Holland, other members of Congress. Uh, but again, we couldn't be here on Free Speech TV. We couldn't be here with Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman, David Packman, and Ring of Fire without your help. We depend on it. So please give us a call at 877 378 8669. At Earth Justice, we defend the environment in the courtroom. Join our fight. When you take a seat, you take a stand. 
Earth justice, because the Earth needs a good lawyer. Twenty-six minutes after the hour. Now here we go on Monday morning, December nine. Uh, well, the one thing that the um, all the talk about Nelson Mandela has done is sort of knock Obamacare off the uh, front page um, for for at least a little while. At any rate, Richard Fowler is here as a uh, friend of Bill these first couple of hours with us this morning. Um, now that the website has been fixed, we're not hearing so much about the. I mean, it hasn't been. Fixed completely fixed. Every, completely fixed, right? But it does seem. To, does it seem to you that we've turned the tide on this? Turned the corner a little bit. Uh, and I how do you think it's going? I don't know if we've turned the corner on it quite yet. I think we'll still have to see what happens in January if more folks lose their health insurance. We don't really know um, what's going to go down there. And I think there has to be. You know, the enrollment. We're only what? It's going to look a lot like Christmas or 20, not, 20 days before this enrollment deadline happens. Um, and, you know, we're not seeing the enrollment. Well, we haven't 23rd seen it. is the deadline. Yeah. Right. For, to have insurance by January. So that's January less than 19, 18 days. Yeah. Um, uh, and so I think we're, there's just going to be the, the, the White House is in a peculiar situation, right? They, it's like they, they advertise the website as sort of the end all beat all at the beginning. I didn't fix the website quick enough or fast enough for folks, especially young Americans, to get engaged and get involved. And so, while this is a great program and a great idea, we've got to make sure the implementation works. So, Are young people signing up? I think they are. I think young people are signing up. But I think there's some young people out there that are saying, hey, you know, maybe the penalty is the way to go and pay $94 this year. And so I really think the White House has to figure out a way to answer those questions. They'd rather uh, pay the penalty than, yeah. than pay the cost of insurance. Because it's $94, right, over yeah. the cost of insurance. And I think insurance is more important, but... It's the world that we live in. Yeah, and convincing people that even though they uh, f- they uh, feel invincible today, they won't always be, be invincible. Yeah, Completely. exactly. Completely agree. When we come back, Daniel Stone from National Geographic um, Worldwide Tour. He'll tell this us all about it. Is the Bill Press Show? Hey, good morning, everybody. What do you say? Nice to see you today. I got to tell you a funny story. So, you know, I was on vacation a week or so ago and uh, met up a, with a couple. Uh, we were chatting over dinner one night, and the guy said to me, So, uh, obviously, you're retired. And I said, What? I'm not retired. I said, What? You think I, because I've got gray hair, I'm retired? No way. I'm not going to retire because I love what I'm doing, and I really do. Look, Having to get up so early to do this show uh, is no fun, but doing the show is something that I just look forward to every single day. I mean, it's great fun uh, getting up, getting on top of the news, having the first crack of the news every day, being able to line up all of our guests, the best guests we can find uh, to bring to you, and then hearing from you all over the country, your calls, your comments on the news of the day, it's just the best job, I think, in the world. And it's especially great, uh, and I especially love now, being able to do this job on Free Speech TV and joining such giants in broadcasting as Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman and the good friends over at uh, Michael Papantonio and the others at Ring of Fire. Uh, And it's all on Free Speech TV, the kind of hard-hitting, independent, uncensored news and commentary that you get nowhere else. That's the value of Free Speech TV. But of course... You know, without any government funding, without any corporate funding, we depend on you to keep us going here at Free Speech TV. We work only for you. And so once again, we turn here at the end of the year to ask for your help, because without your help, we would not be on the air. And now at the end of the year is a good time to do it, because you not only help us and help everybody at Free Speech TV, but you help yourself by getting that good tax deduction. As a little incentive 
to help us out. A couple things to keep in mind. If you can help us with 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year, we will give you a copy of two great books. My latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers, and Joe Sirincioni, frequent guest here on the Bill Press Show, his latest book, Nuclear Nightmares, a real great book. For uh, 20 bucks a month, 240 bucks a year, we'll give you three of the favorite books that I read this year, all in paperback. Norm Ornstein's book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks. This great little book about science by Mary Roach called Bonk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. And Michael Dibden, great mystery writer. All of his mysteries take place in uh, Sicily, in Italy. One of my favorites is Blood Rain that takes place in Sicily. And for those of you who can uh, offer 360 uh, a year or 30 bucks a month, we'll give you three exclusive one-hour interviews that I've conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C. And beyond that, if you're fortunate enough to be able to help Free Speech with $1,000, you can get one of these beautiful Carol Press scarves. So give us a call. Make your pledge at 877-378-8669. Thank you. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. Now at youtube.com slash talker TV. That's T A W K R T V. This is the Bill Press Show. All right, here we go. 33 minutes after the hour, the Bill Press Show on this Monday morning, December 9, coming to you live from our nation's capital. And we have a full house this half hour, do we ever? Uh, Richard Fowler, who's been here as a uh, friend of Bill. Good to have you back, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so from much. From the sir. Richard Fowler Show, fellow talk show host, RichardFowlerShow.com. And back from his uh, worldwide travels, uh, shaved his beard just for today's show. Daniel Stone, a uh, good friend of the show, reporter for National Geographic. Welcome home. Good morning. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Richard, Daniel was here when he uh, went off uh, on launching his, uh, his uh, I don't know what you would call it, Conquer the World Tour, <laughs> whatever it was. <laughs> Make me sound like a musician. Uh, a tour of the world, uh, an innovation tour to learn about new ideas uh, unfolding around the world. Was launched right here <laughs> on, on the Bill Press Show. Bill, on the Bill Press Show, right. So we <laughs> want to have him come back and find and, and tell us uh, what he uh, discovered. And you might notice one thing about that: all three of us have in common this morning. We're all wearing beautiful hand-woven scarves by Carol Press. All right, uh, the best weaver in the world, the color, uh, and uh, we happen to match. I think we did pretty well. Huh? Yeah, we for, tried to make it for work. Three, for three guys early in the morning, I think we did, I we think did just we, fine. I, I think we look, we, look, we look pretty good. Just gives you an example. If you look at them, are three different styles, three different colors, three different patterns, and there are lots more available. These are all rayon chenille scarves. If you go to our website, billpressshow.com, and click on the upper right-hand corner, Carol Press Scarves, you can see these and others like it. And think about... Um, Rewarding yourself this holiday season with something beautiful and warm to wear, or perhaps as a gift for someone that you uh, is very special in you in your life. So, Dan, tell us where did you? First of all, how many countries did you visit? It was seven That's countries. Seven countries in uh, seven days. <laughs> it was about four weeks, uh, so uh, one month. So it was a pretty quick trip. We. Uh, uh, we was you weren't long in any one place. In other words. No, we certainly didn't feel on vacation. Uh, it was myself and a photographer, uh, and the two of us went around the world and stopped in some of these countries to visit with researchers, uh, grantees of National Geographic, people who have received uh, grants to pursue research, uh, and innovators pursuing uh, new ideas related to a broad diversity of geographic themes. Or, and people can kind of, if, if, if people who were not following you 
can go and and now uh, right. take a look at what you discovered where at NASA? All, all of our packages on each country are at Onward. That was the name of our trip, onward.nationalgeographic.com. Onward.nationalgeographic.com. Okay, so give us the countries in order. I know you started in Iceland. I wait, was wait, wait do you hear what he did in Iceland. I'm going to tell you about that. Yeah, but <laughs> we started in Iceland. All right, and then? Then to uh, Italy. Mm-hmm. Then we went to uh, Tanzania. Uh, we stopped in Dubai, uh, UAE. Uh-huh. Uh, India. Yeah. Indonesia. Then we stopped in Guam uh, and uh, then ended in Hawaii. Wow. So... I uh, called uh, into the show. Do you remember where I was when I called? You were in Guam. Uh, Guam. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you remember. Yeah. Uh, no, well, uh, we don't get many calls from Guam. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have many. <laughs> but Guam is part of the United States, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. It is the furthest territory from the mainland U.S. Uh, and it is the furthest ahead time-wise. And it's it's territorial. It's not a state. It's a territory. Territorial slogan is where America starts its day. Is that right? Okay. Because so in Iceland, you started your trip, Richard, uh, scuba diving in how, how cold was the water? <laughs> we were in the freshwater fissures on land. This is where two continents come together. There's like a little canyon. The water there, Fahrenheit about 34, 35 degrees, oh boy. just slightly above freezing. Uh, which was remarkable uh, to to be in these canyons. You're seeing life forms that you don't normally see. These are invertebrates, very tiny things, and it's just remarkably beautiful. Most of Iceland is just beautiful. Not even far from from the mainland U.S., but that was a real treat to dive with a researcher pursuing uh, categories of biodiversity, trying to find out new species that live in a very unique ecosystem. And what is the value of these little invertebrates in the fissures of Iceland? Why should we give a rat's ass? Well, I mean, problem? that's that's the question. And, and this is the year 2013. And the fact that there are places on the wor- in the world that we still don't know what kind oh. of things live there. She's trying to categorize these species so you can create a map of the ecosystem there. Uh, and once you know there, you can, you can set a conservation plan. You could think about the future. Uh, you could talk about how to restore certain areas and how to protect them as well. All right. Now, um, I should... So, help me out here. You brought some photographs in for those watching on Free Speech TV Correct. and on the video stream uh, at Talker TV. Uh, and We could go through a few of them uh, for, for those listeners. Uh, this is actually about a month after Iceland. This is in Hawaii. Uh, this is a place we stopped. Uh, at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. And these are a pair of tree roots uh, from some fig trees, the most remarkable tree roots we, I'd ever seen. Uh, this is also where they filmed uh, the movie Jurassic Park. Uh, that scene where they come across the eggs was right here on these trees. Uh, so this was this in This is Hawaii. on the island of Kauai. On Kauai. Which uh, I think is the most beautiful of the Hawaiian islands. Uh, if, right? if not in the whole world, it was the most beautiful place that we, we stopped was in Kauai. Is that right? So of all these places that you went to, the most beautiful was Well, it's, it's hard to make USA. superlatives, but yes. Uh, all of these places, you know, India, Iceland, Tanzania, very culturally rich, very dynamic, so much happening. Uh, but Kauai, the last stop, was a real treat uh, to, to see someplace truly wild. And Hawaii, as you know, the most isolated uh, group of islands, archipelago in the world. So uh, that creates some interesting flora and fauna uh, characteristics unique to there. I didn't realize that. Uh, the most isolated in terms of the farthest from any mainland? Or? Correct. Wow. Yeah. And because of that, you have plant species and, and, and animal species, not as many mammals, but mainly plants that are endemic there. 90% of plants found on Hawaii are endemic. I mean, they're, they're, they're found nowhere else in the world. Um, they, they evolved. It's a unique ecosystem uh, where you have a, a case of evolution similar to what Darwin found in the Galapagos. I was just going to say, aren't the Galapagos like that? The too? Galapagos yeah. and Madagascar is also very unique uh, off the coast of, of Africa. Uh, so, but Hawaii is the most isolated of any any group of islands in the world. What did you find in Tanzania? Tanzania, uh, we went to uh, to Arusha near near Mount Kilimanjaro to meet with a researcher pursuing uh, big cat conservation. She's one trying to save populations of uh, lions, cheetahs, tigers. Her name was Laylee Lichtenfeld, and we went on safari with her mm. uh, to learn about how these big cats coexist with local tribes, local families who live in the area. There are practices in that area of these tribes killing the cats, killing lions, 
after the lions kill their cows. Um, so there's a retaliatory killing uh, relationship that's set up. She's trying to put an end to that by protecting the cows. This is still going on. Oh, this goes on every day, yeah. Uh, and there are big populations of lions in Serengeti National Park. Everyone knows about Serengeti. Right. But further east in Africa, <coughs> these are different populations of lions, and there's only about five to 600 of these left uh, in the wild, so it's a very, very limited population. The fact that they're being killed to that extent, getting down to such a small number, uh, really threatens their uh, genetic diversity and their ability to, to you know, recover uh, from, from that. Well, what's the answer to round them up and put them into national parks? Or Well, the, the, for the most part, they're in national parks, but it's these cows. You know, when, when a lion kills a cow, the owner of the cow kills the lion. So what this researcher is trying to do is build better fences around these cows. They're called BOMAs, B-O-M-A, uh, to construct better fences, which seems like a very simple solution, but it makes a pretty big difference. So she goes around to different families to build these these fences uh, in a strategic way to protect the cows. And if you protect the cows, you, you pretty much cut off uh, the retaliation component. It just seems to me that the lion's worth a lot more than a cow. It is, but some of these families, I mean, cows are their, their livelihood. It's their current... cow. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. And it's their currency. I mean... These people don't right. have bank accounts. They don't have, you know, cash and wallets. They have cows, and that's essentially how you create value. So if you kill, if someone kills one of your cows, it's essentially like them taking, you know, $5,000 from you. And if someone did that to any of us, you know, you'd, you'd certainly have strong feelings. Mm -hmm. I, I can see some of these um, sort of wild and unusual places, but come on, Italy. I mean... <laughs> Uh, that's not. This is not roughing it in Italy. Keep here. in mind, we had to find places that were all connected geographically. We could find direct flights between Italy. Oh, oh. It, but Italy, we went to now meet. Now we got it, Richard. <laughs> oh, there had to be a direct flight. <laughs> right. Italy, we went to meet an archaeologist who is pursuing research on the Iceman. The Iceman is one of the most famous mummies found outside of Egypt, uh, and a five thousand year old man uh, who was found in the Alps in the early nineties. Uh, in remarkably good condition. The fact that he was up in the Alps, essentially freeze-dried for 5,000 years. He exists now in a museum, but he provides the best look at what Europeans lived like four to 5,000 years ago. Um, and we got to see the actual Iceman and all the things he was found with, from his clothes, his food, his hunting uh, accessories, to learn about what Europeans were like. Wow. That, uh, are there any more of these, do they think, out uh, there? Yeah, I mean, there's, are they looking for more? There are a lot of the Alps that have not been explored. And the reason why is that, uh, you know, it's covered in, in snow all year right, round. Right, right. Um, so there, there's an effort now to, to take ice cores from that area to learn about climatic changes and also to excavate certain areas that would seem to be strategic uh, for humans to have passed through about right. four Do we have thousand. another a photo for our uh, video stream? Let's see if Cyprian's... Uh, Just pop one up here? No? Sure, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so this was a different story. This was in Indonesia. This was uh, on the north end of the island of Sumatra, where they had a big earthquake and tsunami in 2005, uh, 2004, I'm sorry. Uh, and we went to meet with a group pursuing drone conservation. They're using drones. Uh, so similar. There we go. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh, we talked earlier That's about drones. They're using really? drones in the south here to, to go after feral pigs. Feral pigs, yeah. So drones are now becoming a use, uh, a, a part of a strategy. Uh, to combat invasive species like feral pigs and also to protect native species like orangutans that live only on the island of Sumatra and in Malaysia. Um, so you have these very defined populations of orangutans uh, and this group is trying to bring in drones and fly them overhead of, ra of these rainforests to essentially map out where the populations of these primates are, where they're likely to sleep, where they're likely to breed, and where they're likely to eat. And if you could create that portrait, which normally you could never do on foot, uh, yeah. if, you, if you could do it with drones, uh, it creates a much cheaper and much more effective conservation. Suddenly, I'm starting to feel better about drones. <laughs> yeah, man, you can get uh, they could deliver Amazon to your house <laughs> and pizza to your house, and they could also save the world's biodiversity. There you go. All right. Daniel Stone is with us from National Geographic. Uh, find out all about his uh, wonderful trip here. Uh, very, very interesting. All the discoveries he made at onward.nationalgeographic.com. Questions, comments, suggestions for the next worldwide tour, 866-55-PRESS is the toll-free number. This is the Bill Press Show. <laughs> Hey, 
Hey, good morning, fellow Americans. Good to have you with us today. You know, it's, of course, a very special time of the year. And so we come to you with a very special message today. And let me put it as plain as I can. We need your help. Look, I don't have to tell you how important free speech TV is. You wouldn't be watching if you didn't enjoy it. It's been around for a long time. I'm proud to be the new kid on the block on free speech TV because joining the company of Tom Hartman, Amy Goodman, the good friends at the Ring of Fire, David Pakman, you get on free speech TV the kind of unfettered, uncensored, totally independent, unvarnished, hard-hitting news and commentary that you can't find anywhere else. Better than NPR because you can count on free speech TV to get your news and commentary from a a strong, liberal, progressive tradition. But the fact is, we wouldn't be able to do this without your help. You know, Free Speech TV gets no government funding, no corporate funding. It's all up to you. We depend on you. We work only for you. So we need your help to keep us going. Many of you have already contributed and pledged and supported Uh, Free Speech TV for years. We encourage you to renew your pledge at this time. And for those of you just joining Free Speech TV, new to Free Speech TV, join our team by making a generous contribution here at the end of the year. If you can give us $120 a year, that's just uh, 10 bucks a month. We've got a special gift for you, a copy of my latest book, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the uh, Koch brothers, and a copy of Joe Cirincione, one of our favorite guests on the show, his latest book, very strong book, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can help us with $240 a year, that's $20 a month, three co- three books. My three favorite books I read this year, Norm Ornstein's a book about Congress, It's Worse Than It Looks. This book by Mary Roach, a great little fun book about science. This is Science and Sex, called Bunk, fun book. And then a great mystery novel by Michael Dibden called Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily, where I just got back from vacation. If you can help us with $360 a a year, that's $30 a month. Three CDs, exclusive interviews that I conducted at the Hill Center here in Washington, D.C., available nowhere else. And for those of you who are uh, able to do so and feel generous enough to help Free Speech TV with a thousand dollars, a very, very special gift. We will uh, make sure that you get a scarf just like this one, a hand woven rayon chenille scarf by my wife, Carol Press, who is the best weaver in the world. So, those are just incentives for you to join us on Free Speech TV. But again, we're here for you every day, and we ask you here, particularly at the end of the year, take advantage of the tax deduction. We ask you to be here for us. Give a call at 877-378-8669. Again, uh, from Bullfight Strategies, Reed Epstein from Politico will be along as well. And meanwhile, he's back. Yeah, he's back from his uh, worldwide investigative uh, reporting mission, Daniel Stone from uh, National Geographic. You can follow uh, his travels at onward.nationalgeographic.com. You know, I'm, I want to go back to the travel t- trip, but I'm interested in National Geographic. I mean, one of the great magazines of all time, one of the most successful and this is a time when print magazines are not doing so well, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Newsweek disappeared. Now they say they're going to come back. I doubt it's going to work. U.S. News, U.S. News and World Report, gone forever. Life. I mean, you can go through the list of print magazines that have disappeared. National Geographic, still hanging in? Still healthy. Uh, uh-huh. You know, Nat Geo, we've, we've experienced a lot of the same uh uh, trends as, as any magazine. No one's really thriving in the marketplace at the moment with print ads. Uh, but more than 7 million people still read the magazine every month. Um, and That's uh, amazing. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's there's mm-hmm. a demand for it, and, and it's the stories, it's the photography mainly. Um, and, uh, but most so of, what is the new media? How, how is Nat Geo... By the way, I just think the phrase Nat Geo is a shows that you're moving with you know there's innovation innovation uh, yeah yeah th- i mean there's expansion as well so you know there's tablet editions uh, mm-hmm. that a lot of people i work with work on on the ipad and on the <laughs> kindle uh, and all, all sorts mm-hmm. of tablets there's a lot of social media there's a lot of things you can read about unique 
uh, to the web, uh, unique to Instagram, unique to, to Twitter, uh, and Facebook that a lot of our staff now devotes a lot of time to. It used to be explorers and photographers working for six months to a year on one story. Uh, now we, we work a lot faster. We still produce those very fully baked stories uh, every month in the magazine, but there's also a lot more content that's more immediate, uh, that's more relevant to the, to the news of the day. Which is nationalgeographic.com, not geo.com? Uh, nationalgeographic.com. We actually just redesigned the website this weekend. So. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Breaking news here, huh? <laughs> hey, <laughs> you heard it here first. Yes. All right, uh, let's get another photo up sure. for our uh, video streamers. And um, Okay, so this is a photo, <laughs> this is the only photo of me, uh, which oh. is unique. And um, it's a photo of me because I didn't take it. Uh, this is when we were in Tanzania. We were meeting that's with... That's not you. That is me. We were meeting with one of these... Look at that, Richard. That doesn't that's, look like him. That's not you. It looks exactly like me. <laughs> Uh, we were meeting with the Maasai family in eastern uh, Tanzania. Maasai is the biggest tribe in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, several hundred thousand people live in that area. Uh, this tribe, uh, no, mainly known for their bright colors that they wear. Uh, and uh, I had a, a fairly, I had my like, decent camera with me. Some of these kids had never seen a camera. Uh, they had never seen images of themselves. Um, you know, they don't, they don't own mirrors, and they wow. live in a pretty remote place. So when I took a photo and I showed them the back of the camera, here's, here's what it looked like. They were so excited. I gave them my camera, and I said, you know, just, just click the button here. And these kids went around and took, I don't know, a couple hundred photos. Most of them were not great, but this was the first one that one of the kids took. It's a, it's a photo of me, uh, and I figured, you know, first photo ever. I grabbed a photo right after that of him taking a photo, so we have this unique pairing of photos of, of this, this little boy's it's first photo. It's, it's still hard to believe there are people on this planet. Who haven't taken a photo. Right. Or yeah. haven't and there seen are people her. around here who take, you know, 100 photos every minute, you know, on right. their smartphones. So. Uh, it was it was very refreshing and, and eye opening. Or haven't seen a photo of themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, quickly, I'm interested in India too. Um, what was I, the project in India? India is remarkable. There, we, it wasn't a science question. It was it was artistic. We went to meet with an artist uh, who has received money from National Geographic uh, to pursue innovative solutions for community in in art. So how do you get people oh. when you have a population of millions of people in a city in India? or billions of people, uh, over a billion in India that you have, uh, how, do you, how do you promote self-expression? How do you get people uh, to, to stand up for what they believe in? How do you get them to express themselves? He does it through murals. He works with kids. Uh, and he essentially helps them create hacks in their daily life, things that could make their lives easier. Uh, his name is Raghava KK. Uh, he's an artist, and he's, uh, he works a lot in America and mm -hmm. a lot a lot in India. So we went around with him through all the socioeconomic levels in Bangalore. All right. Well, we just hopscotched through uh, a couple of the, some of the highlights here uh, with Daniel Stone. Welcome back. Nice Thank to you. see you again. And again, you can follow the whole, the whole experience at onward.nationalgeographic.com. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Phil. Good job. I Richard, we've got to get a job like this. I mean, I know. Get to, to travel around the world and take the pictures. stuff you and I talk about like every day, you know, and we're... Glued here to our <laughs> studios and everything, and he's out there hopscotching around. Next the world. time you could come with, I could use a I could use a road dog. You'd have to grow a beard though. <laughs> <laughs> I can grow a beard if I get to go to seven countries. I'm sorry, right. being you, buckled you, down in the belt. Why? You got it. <laughs> and when we come back, I'll tell you what the president's up to today. Thanks. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, friends and neighbors, a very special message for you this morning. Here we are getting close to the end of the year already. And two things that, at this time of the year that all of us think about. Number one, taxes. Yeah, if you're like me and Carol, this is when you line up your favorite causes, your favorite organizations. You want to be sure to get those checks sent them, into them before the end of the year. Number one, uh, because you like supporting good causes. But number two, because you like being able to take advantage of the tax deductions before the end of the year. And when you think about your favorite causes, think free speech TV. Look, we depend on it. You know, uh, depend on you. Free speech TV, as you know, gets no corporate money, no government money. All of our funding comes from our viewers. It's just as simple. We wouldn't be here without your support. So we ask you to 
step up to the plate again here at the end of the year. And the other thing, of course, people think about in December are gifts. Gifts to yourself, gift to your friends. We can combine the two for a pledge to Free Speech TV. We'll send you gifts that you can consider end of the year gifts to yourself or someone special to you. Uh, here's how. For a 120 bucks pledge, uh, which is 10 bucks a month, think of it that way, copies of two great books, my latest one, The Obama Hate Machine, all about the Koch brothers and all the evil they're doing, plus a copy of Joe Cirincione, one of our favorite guests here on the Bill Press Show, Joe Cirincione's latest book from the Plowshares Fund, Nuclear Nightmares. If you can pledge 240 bucks a month, that's tw- 240 bucks a year, 20 bucks a month, the three of the favorite books that I read this year, one about Congress, Norm Ornstein's It's Worse Than It Looks. This one, my favorite science writer, Mary Roach, and her book called Bunk, The Curious Coupling of Science and Sex. Woohoo! And thirdly, um, my favorite mystery writer, Michael Dibden, writes books about Italy. My favorite is Blood Rain, which takes place in Sicily. And then for 360 bucks a month, a real special deal and ex- exclusive copies of three interviews that I conducted here at the Hill Center in Washington, D.C., one hour each with Mark Leibovich from the New York Times, Bishop Gene Robinson, and Senator Mary Landrieu. And for those of you who can make a very special pledge to Free Speech TV of $1,000, an extraordinary gift, here it is, scarf, just like this one, a hand-woven scarf. This is Rayon Chenille. It could also be in bamboo done by the greatest weaver in the world, my wife, Carol Press. So if you can help us, please, we love bringing you the show every day. I love getting up early in the morning, having the first crack at news and commentary with you, bringing in the best guests that we can get for you. You know, our regulars, Arthur Delaney, Igor Volsky, Congressman Chris Holland, other members of Congress. Uh, But again, we couldn't be here on Free Speech TV, couldn't be here with Tom Hartman and Amy Goodman, David Fackman, and Ring of Fire without your help. We depend on it. So please give us a call at 877-378-8669. Yes, indeed. President Obama and the First Lady are in the motorcade on their way to Andrews Air Force Base, uh, from which they will leave at uh, 8.20, about 20 minutes from now, for South Africa and for the memorial service tomorrow, the first of two big memorial services this week for Nelson Mandela. When we come back, Carl Frisch from Bullfight Strategies here is another friend of Bill. Reed Epstein joining us from Politico. Richard Fowler stays with us. And you will be right back.
Broadcasting around the nation, on your radio, on your TV, and online. This is the Bill Press Show. Hey, careful driving out there. A lot of snow, a lot of sleet, a lot of rain, uh, just about all across the country. So uh, take care of yourself (laughs) while you're listening to the Bill Press Show. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. Thanks for joining us. It is the Bill Press Show coming to you live from our nation's capital, All across this great land, uh, booming out to you on your local progressive talk radio station. You can also catch us uh, this hour on our video stream at Talker TV, youtube.com slash Talker TV. And to help us through the uh, news of the day and um, what's going on and your reaction to it, uh, two good friends uh, in studio with us. Richard Fowler has been here with us all morning as a uh, friend of Bill from the Richard Fowler Show, richardfowlershow.com. Richard, thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for having me, Bill. All right, you're looking good. Uh, and joining us, a regular good friend of the show, friend of Bill, Carl Frisch from Bullfight Strategies. How hey, are you, Carl, Bill? you're looking good. Thank you. 
<laughs> Still sporting the uh, the 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 uh, Nats cap, huh? Well, my hair is uh, deciding to do all kinds of different. You have a bad hair day. Yes, <laughs> I'm having a bad hair day. <laughs> and w- with Carl, when it's not bad hair, it's 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 singular. That's what, yeah. What hair I do have is having a bad hair day. <laughs> Just in from Colorado. That's right. right? Yeah, uh, out what's there going for the on in Colorado. The Annual uh, Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund conference. Uh, all the LGBT elected officials from around the country coming together to learn how to be better legislators, better elected officials, how to make sure that they get reelected, all that kind of stuff. Right. And is there uh, any reason why the uh, this year's uh, LGBT conference was held in one of the two states that has legalized marijuana? I don't know. Uh, I think Jared Polis has uh, <laughs> sponsored legislation to legalize marijuana. Um, it certainly fits... Uh, the state of Colorado. Um, but, you know, Colorado is the last state to pass civil unions. It'll probably be the last state ever to pass civil unions because nobody's really pushing in that direction anymore. So it's certainly an interesting place. It's also a state where the leader... Has not recognized not No marriage, marriage equality yet, no but uh, equality, civil unions yeah. last year. And both uh, chambers of the legislature, the Assembly and the Senate there, are led by LGBT uh, leaders, the Speaker and the... And the uh, so do you uh, think it's likely that they'll, that they'll um, pass I think legislation marriage equality on marriage the equality? Next, well, they've got a constitutional amendment there. Oh. And I, the LGBT community is going to come up against that now. 36 states have uh, constitutional right, right. amendments, and that's going to be the big <coughs> difficult path. Sure. They're all a little bit different. Turning those around right. is going to be tough. Right. And expensive. And expensive, right. Uh, say hello to our team here this morning. Peter Ogburn's got the day off. He'll be back tomorrow. Stevie Lee Webb flying the 747 this morning. Yes, sir. Indeed, the Stevie Lee. Thank a- you. 380 this morning. <laughs> the 380, <laughs> Airbus 380. Mm-hmm. Flew one of those last week. They're a sweet plane. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Alisa Murphy, our new associate morning. producer with Alicia Cruz on the phones. Hello. And Cyprian Balding, as always, on the, uh, on the video cam. We've been talking, Carl, a lot this morning about preparations for the a uh, big memorial service. Right. Uh, President Obama and the First Lady will be soon leaving, uh, on their way to Air- Andrews Air Force Base, soon leaving for South Africa. And we learned, uh, Richard, that's going to be an unwelcome element at the uh, Nelson Memorial Service as well, right? Yes, indeed, it's true. The West Baptist Westboro Baptist Church, the fringe pseudo-Christian group, are planning on, they've booked flights to attend the funeral in protest. And the reason being is that Mandela was married three times and divorced twice, Thus, he has committed adultery. Thus, they've decided to protest. I hope they don't let them get near that stadium. Thus, they I, might not come back. I have a feeling that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have a feeling <laughs> that they may not know that uh, uh, their freedoms they enjoy here in America are not necessarily the, the freedoms <laughs> they would enjoy elsewhere. <clears throat> um, it's, it's also quite interesting. I mean, uh, Fred Phelps' daughter uh, is divorced. So, um, I, this is this church, for people that don't know, uh, it's from Kansas, and they've been around and on the political scene since Matthew Shepard was murdered uh, some 15 years ago um, in that brutal, ha- brutal hate crime in Wyoming. Disgusting. Total. Started out what is there, a total of 12 of them or something? Yeah, the, roughly. I mean, two of the granddaughters left the church last year and, uh, um, you know, uh, swore off the church. Um, so uh, Shirley Phelps' daughters, basically. Um, so it's it's a bizarre cult centered around this guy Fred Phelps, um, and you know it, they are all everybody's f- favorite punching bag. They're all, the fam- all family members too, aren't they? Uh, mostly, yeah. mostly. Well, uh, disgusting, disgusting. I'm glad you called them pseudo Christians because uh, <laughs> that uh, is indeed the correct th- word. They're not for really them. they're not really members uh, of the club. So Carl Frisch here with Richard Fowler and uh, Reed Epstein from Politico will be joining us uh, at the half to talk about more of the news of the day. Um, the Mandela Memorial Service this week will certainly dominate the news. Um, President Obama, and again, the First Lady, will be there tomorrow with 53 different world leaders, including um, former President Bill Clinton, former President Jimmy Carter, who's the one who imposed sanctions uh, on South Africa, and former President George W. Bush, um, and some 20, what'd you say, 24 20? members of Congress. 24 members of Congress so far. Right? So far. I mean, they've already left. According to the reports, they left <laughs> as of yesterday. Um, that includes some member <laughs> members of the Congressional Black Caucus, John Lewis, John Conyers, Charlie Rangel, Mel Watts, hopefully he'll be the new um, head of housing soon, um, Sheila Jackson Lee, Barbara Lee, J.K. Butterfield, Al Green, D.C. Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, um, Cory Booker, 
as well as Republican Tea Party favorite Ted Cruz. We've been trying to figure that one out, Carl. Ted Cruz. He's bucked his party on this one. Yeah, a lot of conservatives <laughs> to the far right are criticizing him for. Are you saying crazy that Ted Mandela. Cruz might want to go to the cameras? They <laughs> might be interested in where the cameras are. <laughs> might be looking to soften his image. Just possibly. I mean, he's you know pissing Wh- off the far right. Where's Marco Arizona? Rubio? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Marco Rubio is worried about complete collapse. I mean, uh, it's interesting to see the right react to Mandela's passing, given um, how small a role they played in. Uh, you know, getting South Africa to, to finally change and become a more free country. Well, uh, I would say, in fact, given the um, obstructionist role right. that they that, that they played, we, we talked about that, some of that a little bit earlier, and our good friends at uh, Igor Volsky at Think Progress put out a timeline that goes back to the 1960s when National Journal saying this will be the collapse of Western civilization if the ANC were ever to take over. You know, of course, Ronald Reagan and Dick Cheney branded uh, Nelson Mandela and the ANC, a terrorist, a right. ter- head of a terrorist organization. Uh, e- even as recently as with the war in Iraq, which uh, Saddam, I mean, which Nelson Mandela opposed, he was accused then of being an ally of Saddam Hussein, right? right. Because he opposed the war. So there has always been that element in the, in the Republican Party who have considered him. Uh, an outcast and a commie, pinko. Yeah, he's still in the way of all these Western banks for making so much money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I remember, I mean, my first political activity was not the fight against apartheid, but I was part of that uh, movement in in California at the time when the big move was to get... The the big protest at the University of California, Berkeley, were revolved around getting the university to divest from its investments in South Africa. And those of us on that side were branded, again, as, you know, radicals, revolutionaries, sure. communists. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was something that was all over the country. Um, University of Cali- the <laughs> California state system. Um, I, Joe Trippi, uh, Howard Dean's campaign manager, uh, became involved in politics because of his university's investments in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and as did in, Barack Obama. Right. We said yeah. that last week. Now, we've got something as bad as, a, I don't know whether you know this. Uh, we have something as bad as apartheid uh, in this country. I can guess what it is. Right now. You know what it is. Rick Santorum told us what it was yesterday on Fox News Sunday. Here he is. But you're right. I mean, what he was advocating for was, was not necessarily the, the right answer, but he was fighting against some, some great injustice. And, and I would make the argument that, you know, we have a great injustice going on right now in this country with, uh, with, with an ever-increasing size of government that is taking over and controlling people's lives. And Obamacare is front and center in that. Hmm. Right? You were right. <laughs> of course it was Obamacare. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Obamacare if is it's not the Holocaust, movie. if it's not slavery, right. it's apartheid. Well, Obamacare. actually, Obamacare is just like the Holocaust with a little bit of slavery, a dash of apartheid, oh. Oh, maybe boy. some salt and pepper for seasoning. Um, these people are freaking crazy, Bill. They're <laughs> freaking crazy. And, you know, Rick Santorum, when we thought we got rid of him by booting his butt from the Senate, no. Now he's making Hollywood movies. Now he's going on Fox News to talk about uh, this kind of stuff, this garbage. Um, But this is what we're going to experience. Um, We're now in the phase of Obamacare where um, people are beginning to sign up, and soon they'll start to use their care. And the worst nightmare of Republican politicians in Washington and the people that are part of the Republican financing uh, operation, the people that make so much money off of the the dim-witted base, um, are are worried that Obamacare is going to work and people are going to love that they have coverage now. Millions of people. I have coverage for the first time in two and a half years because of Obamacare. Um, and once people start to use that coverage, all of the, you know, uh, naysaying, all of the, you know, uh, screaming at the top of their lungs about how horrible and how freedom, uh, you know, is destroyed because of Obamacare, all of that stuff will fall by the wayside. The stories I heard read again, I think it's in the New York Times yesterday, it was an, uh, the, the, an, another column saying, it all hinges on young people and whether enough young people sign up and whether enough millennials sign up. Now, we have to have a millennial in the studio here with us this morning. Uh, you know, there are organizations out there 
the Koch brothers putting a lot of money in organizations, convinced, trying to convince young people not to sign up for Obamacare. No, that is completely right. I think there, there's a big investment in fo- f- trying to get young people not to sign up because this law is, and the truth of the matter is, I think those who create the law would tell you the how the formula is set up. You have to have a, a certain number of young people sign up for the program for it to work. Now, with that being said, I, I think that we need to see, there needs to be a, a broader PR campaign on our side to tell people what the benefits of getting health care, the benefits of signing up. Um, and the benefits that, hey, listen, just because the website had some issues doesn't mean, you know, your insurance policy is going to have some issues. And so we've got to communicate that better to millennials um, to make this thing work. Do you think, uh, yeah. Do you think it, Carl? I, look, I, I think it's very difficult to get millennials. Um, and you're on the older side of the millennials, so you're not quite college no, aged I'm, anymore. I'm right in the middle, right in the middle of the millennials. Uh, 26. So, well, yeah. What is it? 34 <laughs> to 18. Yeah, so I'm um, right dead smack in the middle. Um, <laughs> and I think it's very hard to get college kids to think about anything else other than um, uh, everything other than healthcare. Things, you know, they're invincible and everything else. Um, so I think we do need to do more. Um, Obamacare doesn't fail if we don't get enough. Uh, young people to sign up. We just need to redouble our efforts if that's the case. Uh, the funding mechanism, is, as Richard said, uh, is such that you need plenty of healthy people. It's right. ins- sure. It's In insurance. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, um, that, no, that's the way it works. But the president started to get that message out, I thought, last week right. uh, when he was at American University. Uh, and he pointed out again, you can, under their, under some of these plans, you can get health care for for um, cheaper than you can than your cell phone bill or your cable TV bill. That is true, and I think, and to be perfectly honest, I think if you see in the state exchanges where the where the governor set up their exchange and the governor and, and the states right. running their own PR campaigns, enrollment's overwhelming. And you look at Connecticut, you look at California, you look Kentucky. at Oregon, you look at um, did I say Connecticut? I did. Kentucky. Connecticut's one. Ken, Ken, Kentucky's another one. Um, Maryland is one where they know how to target their particular base. This is not. This is one of those things where it can't be a national PR campaign because healthcare isn't really a national thing, right? It's a local, my doctor's around the corner, my doctor's two blocks away, and so it has to be advertised in that mechanism. Um, and because a lot of Republican governors have decided not to implement the exchange in their home states, um, or they decided not to take Medicaid expansion, that's the problem that we're having, is that we can't really penetrate local markets and talk to local young people because we have to have a broader national strategy, which is part of the problem. And Carl, isn't it interesting that for suddenly we no longer hear Republicans talking about repeal and replace? <laughs> is it is it interesting, Bill? Because they've I mean, never wanted to replace. They've ne- no. Bill, if they could be honest, if we could get inside their head and just speak for them, uh, what their brains actually thought, they would say, not only are we going to get rid of Obamacare, we're going to get rid of Social Security care, or as John Fugelson calls it, FDR care. Um, you know, we're going to get rid of Medicare, or as John Fugelson calls it, LBJ care. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get rid of early childhood education. We're going to get rid of uh, everything. The only thing that the federal government will have a responsibility to do is protect our borders and international affairs. That's what this Republican Party believes in, and that's why they're failing. Um, you know, the, if they were even partially smart, um, they would come out uh, and try and make this program work because then they could say that they were working with the president to make sure that this program worked. Um, and then they could focus on other issues that they might be able to put a wedge in. Uh, but they've lost the fight over Obamacare. And the only reason that they continue to push it is because they've so entrenched themselves in their opposition to Obamacare uh, to make the money off the base um, that keeps on writing those checks and giving those donations online. But, you know, their final their final blow, or after they realize they're not going to defund it, they're not going to derail it, they're not going to kill it, they're not going to replace it, they're not going to repeal it, they'll just stop calling it Obamacare. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It'll go back to the Affordable Care Act. Exactly. Yeah, right. That'd be true. All right. 21 minutes after the hour with Carl Frisch and Richard Fowler. When we come back, the minimum wage. Uh, big battle. Yet, is there any chance we might get some action on that out of this Congress before they um, head off to their Christmas vacation like three days from now? 866-55-PRESS. You know the toll-free number. We'll be right back. Seen on Free Speech TV and online on Talker TV, this is The Bill Press Show.
is the Bill Press Show. 26 minutes after the hour, Reed Epstein from Politico joining us at the half hour here. Right now we're joined by Richard Fowler and uh, Carl Frisch, both good friends of the program, friends of Bill this morning. Richard, before you leave us, tell us again how people can follow you and find you. Um, www.fowlershow.com, where you can follow us. uh, You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Fowlershow, or tweet us at Fowlershow or at Richard A. Fowler. There's like tons of ways to get to me. You can just Google it if you'd like. They can't miss you, right? No, can't be missed. Richard Fowler. (laughs) There it is, everywhere. So, um, good news on Friday on the jobs front. Uh, The Labor Department announcing 203,000 new jobs created in November. The unemployment rate down to seven, seven, just yeah, seven yeah. flat, yeah, right, to seven to, to seven percent. But two uh, issues still in front of the Congress on snooze. Every, by the way, uh, oh, the by, media, oh yeah, 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 the media just 
there's been what 38 months of consecutive mm -hmm. uh, job growth now yeah. and the media barely even yawns when Who they're just waiting for it to not be a positive uh, job gain report. it's just like when the market keeps going up and up and up you never hear about it yeah right. but if it falls 200 it's points breaking or something. News when it's the first month of consecutive job right. growth obama's polling changes by one percent negative oh the president's in free fall yeah. even though he's been at roughly the same point for five years uh, two issues related to the jobs uh, uh, front that are still in front of Congress. One is 1.3 million Americans will lose their unemployment insurance unless Congress acts by the end of the year. They've always done so in a bipartisan fashion in the past, this year, gentlemen. I don't know. I'm, I, I think Repub House Republic. it's hard to put logic on the Republican conference in the House. One would assume that it would be political suicide for them to... Uh, push us into a government shutdown, yet they did it. One would assume that it would be uh, political suicide to flirt with default, and yet they did it. Yeah. So one would assume that it would be a horrible thing to do over the holidays and the new year to push more than a million people off of these important programs, but... Richard? I, I don't know. I think uh, I... I, I hear that. I, I actually think they'll get, probably get it done. I think John Boehner's realized that he cannot lead for the far right fringe of his party. He brings it to the floor. Democrats vote for it overwhelmingly, and they get the 18 to 20 Republican votes they need. I think the same goes for, uh, not for minimum wage, but at least for the budget deal. He brings it to the floor because he knows they can't afford to shut the government down again. It's interesting. The only way that John Boehner's the House has achieved any Democratic legislation votes. this year right. is when Boehner's been willing to let the entire House vote, Democratic votes, and a small number. And Republicans small. are fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> perfectly okay with it. All right, when we go back, Richard, thanks so much for being Thank here you, this sir. morning. All right, Carl Frisch stays with us as Reed Epstein Show. Show.
Streaming live video right now at youtube.com slash talker TV. That's T-A-W-K-R TV. This is the Bill Press Show. 33 minutes after the hour now here on a cold, rainy day in our nation's capital. It is the Bill Press Show. We're coming to you live from our studio on Capitol Hill, just down the street from the United States Capitol Building. Carl Frisch from Bullfight Strategies here as a friend of Bill this hour, and we are joined by a uh, another good friend of Bill and a neighbor here on Capitol Hill, Reed Epstein, political reporter for and White House reporter for Politico. Reed, good to see you. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Uh, President Obama, we just saw Air Force One taking off from Andrews Air Force Base. You have a front page story in Politico this morning about the preparations for this trip, which had to be put together pretty fast pretty right? quickly usually these uh, overseas trips have are weeks and months in the planning and they have ad- advanced teams and pre-advanced teams uh, a lot of sort of young kids out of college who work for the White House for not very much money who uh, the perks is are they get to spend time all over the world making sure that uh, places are ready for the president and his uh, his, his traveling party to arrive yeah in this case they you know found out that they heard that Mandela died the same time as everyone else on Thursday afternoon and Within hours, uh, Secret Service and military teams were on planes flying to South Africa uh, because they had to boil down what usually takes months into about three and a half days. What does that entail Uh, on the ground? What do they have to... Well, they have to... Everything from uh, making sure that the motorcade routes are arranged to having hotel rooms for the support people uh, in a place where every head of state in the world... Uh, and dignitaries are are competing for the same rental cars, the same hotels, the same uh, you know support staff, all in the same place uh, is not such an easy thing to do. Uh, you're talking about dozens and scores of dozens and dozens of staff trying to come up with maybe forty or fifty vehicles, mm-hmm. uh, all you know instantaneously. Basically, uh, it's uh, not a not a very easy task to do. It involved a lot. In this case, uh, you know, Mandela was 95 years old. It was not a big surprise that he did pass away. Uh, and so there was a, a plan in place from the U.S. Embassy in Pretoria. There was a, actually a secret service office, a permanent secret service office in South Africa uh, that deals with the region. And so the officers who are stationed, the agents and officers who are stationed there had uh, had been working on this plan for, for years. Uh, and so they were ready to put it in place. But once it, once... The news did come. Uh, it was a fairly quick turnaround to to get the get the the facilities ready for the president to arrive. An tomorrow. amazing amount of detail goes into a pres. I, I mean, just moving the president from the White House to the St. Regis Hotel. For lunch, yeah. Well, for, and we for, saw for yesterday lunch. when yeah, he went. But, he, you know, imagine to another country. He went to the Willard Hotel on Saturday for the the Saban Forum, uh, <laughs> and even that involved a motorcade with. Uh, you know, a dozen vehicles and an ambulance. And, yeah, which is and a, a block and a half away. Correct. Well, and you picture, you know, the news comes down and you picture like the Benny Hill music with people running around, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off. But uh, you indicate, you know, that this is not something that was a terrible surprise. It's obviously terrible, but uh, they were kind of expecting it. How much are they actually capable of preparing for something like this in advance? Obviously, you can have plans in place. Uh, but because of the nature of the surprise, not knowing when it's going to happen, you're, you know, the car issue, for example, there must be hundreds of different things just like the car issue that you really can't prepare for unless, you, unless you've got months to prepare for it. Right. And, you, and, you know, the president is, is not going to stay overnight in South Africa. He's going to go to the, the memorial service and get back on Air Force One and come back. But you have... You know all of these all these other staffers who are going to need hotel rooms, and so some of them are going to be you know hours away from the site and be commuting back and forth because you have you know the British Secret Service, the French Secret Service, uh, right. the various all the uh, you know African heads of state who are going to arrive. 
people from all over the world who are showing up. All these people need are need the same facilities that that the president of the United States and his staff needs. Uh, and while the Secret Service doesn't necessarily take anything to chance as far as the president's security, uh, some people who work for them might not be quite as well off. But you're going to, and they also, um, requiring Secret Service protection in South Africa will be former President Bill Clinton, former President George W. Bush, and former President Jimmy Carter. That's right. Uh, and <laughs> President Bush uh, and Laura Bush and Hillary Clinton are on Air Force One with President Obama leaving from, they le- left from Andrews this morning. Oh, they are. For, uh, President, President Bush and Laura and... And, and Hillary Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton and Chelsea Clinton are in, are in Rio for a uh, Clinton Global Initiative event. They're going to be traveling separately and meeting the the White House uh, group in South Africa. But you're right; they all have their own Secret Service details. The former president's details obviously are much smaller right. than President Obama's. Uh, but yeah, you're talking about uh, you know they travel with maybe two or three agents at all times. Uh, where the president's detail is obviously much bigger than that. When will the president return? So uh, we have to remember what is an eight-hour difference, Reed, or do uh, we know? I think nine or ten hour, nine or ten hours. Uh, it's an eighteen-hour flight. They're going to stop in Senegal for refueling on the way there. Uh, the, they'll arrive tomorrow morning, South Africa time. Uh, for the for the memorial service, attend the memorial service, service and, and then come back on the plane and come back. Whoa. So they'll be back Wednesday. They'll be back Wednesday or th- uh, sometime late Wednesday. Thank uh, God the plane's Air Force One and not <laughs> a uh, commuter flight. Yeah, if you're on, you could, <laughs> that'd be a tough trip on Delta Coach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, why this memorial service? Why not the state funeral on Sunday? Well, uh, you know, one, this, this memorial service will give the president a chance to speak. Uh, the expectation is that he'll make some remarks. Uh, we haven't seen a program for everyone who will speak, but uh, President Obama is the leader of the free world. He has mm-hmm. drawn a straight line from Mandela to uh, the fight against apartheid and freeing Mandela from Robben Island to his own political activism uh, speech about divesting uh, his uni- his first college undergrad first college that he attended Occidental yeah. University in California from uh, from investments in South Africa is uh, as he has said the first time that he was made any sort of political speech mm-hmm. uh, and he like other like many others has pointed to Mandela as his personal hero uh, they met once in 2005 uh, when Mandela was in Washington and Obama was a new senator uh, and so it so he'll speak now will he be one of four or five people who speak or one of 30 people who speaks uh, you know we don't, we don't know that yet this uh, stadium Holds 94,000 people? It was their main World Cup stadium. Uh, Do we have a stadium that big? Well, we have some of our college football stadiums are, are that big. Are uh, they? Yeah, yeah I mean, we're not too big on soccer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, but the the New York Giants football stadium holds eighty five or 90,000 people. The Ohio yeah. State's football stadium. When I saw that, I was like, whoa. Ohio but State's football stadium holds 105,000 people. So yeah. we have some big stadiums. Now, I think it was in your story that I read that par- the, the diff- one of the differences here, if the president were speaking when he speaks at any event, if he goes to the Verizon Center here for a game, you know, they put the metal detectors up and everybody has to go through it going into that stadium for that night, for that game, right? right. They're not going to do that in South Africa. Well, they may, but the Secret Service won't be responsible. The Secret Service doesn't have... Uh, they don't have control of the stadium. It's not their jur- They don't have any jurisdiction, and so that's part of what makes those guys nervous. Is they're not about to trust, sort of whether it's the South African uh, security people or the British security people or, or or pretty much anyone with the president's security, and so they uh, are going to position the president in a place where he's he can't with it, where he's safe. Uh, they're not going to have enough personnel on the ground to have someone at every entry point to the stadium. Mm-hmm. Uh, presumably, the South Africans are will have, you know, s- a semblance of security. Uh, you presume that they'll have magnometers or, or whatever on the w- uh, as people enter. But the Secret Service isn't going to count on them to to do what needs to be done. And so, you can expect that there'll be some sort of bulletproof glass, like at the inauguration. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Uh, or that the president and and some of these other dignitaries are sitting behind so that they're so that they're safe at the stadium. 
All right. Then the question is, um, another question is, so what happens here while all this is going on? Because at least 24 members of Congress have already left. Uh, there will be more, I think, going. Right. Um, maybe some for the for the state funeral. So this week until at least, sounds like that we're, in terms of Congress and the White House, basically shut down bet- between for until Thursday, which might not be such a bad thing for President Obama. Uh, you know, the time. <laughs> you know, no one is happy. Certainly, he's not happy that that Mandela died. It's very sad. Um, but the timing was pretty good for President Obama. He sort of wipes the Obamacare mess off the front pages for you know, almost a week. He'll uh, do anything to detract from Obama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. he, he, Fox News. He doesn't have to go. I mean, probably the, the thing he's probably happiest about is uh, tonight, Monday night and Tuesday night are the congressional holiday, ho- congressional holiday, holiday balls. parties at the White House. And so he doesn't have to stand there and shake hands and take pictures with all these members of Congress who he despises. I'm sure the feeling is mutual. I mean, you've got Republicans who probably... Uh, would not be looking forward to Was going it? to the hall. Probably the only thing that probably the they might go food. to the party. I think the parties are still being held. Right. right. But they get Joe Biden instead of the president. They get to shake hands with Joe Biden who, instead. Who I'm sure they're you know, thrilled to see. <laughs> I've <again>. never <laughs> seen that, that line of people at the White House for their holiday photos take longer <laughs> than <laughs> Joe Biden. Um, because they have something to say to every yeah. one of them. You know that, right? If, if, if he could stay until Thursday and skip the one for the press, I'm sure <laughs> he would try to figure out a way to do that. <laughs> it is going to be. A, I mean, it basically nothing's going to get done this week until. No, and uh, the Senate is back today, uh, and there was some sense that they m- may get something done. The the Ryan Murray talks seems to have picked up some steam at the end of last week, uh, but you're right. There's not going to be any any significant legislation that moves through this week, but. There, you know, given this Congress's track f- record, there probably wasn't going to be much in it. I was right. pretty confident that they were going to pass the minimum wage and the employment <laughs> non-discrimination oh, yeah. Act, <laughs> the immigration <laughs> reform, and then this goes and happens, and all hope is lost for the there rules of the conference. Go. <laughs> 16 minutes before the top of the hour with Reed Epstein from Politico, Carl Frisch, Bullfight Strategies on the Bill Press Show. Your questions, your comments, join the fun. We'll find room for you at the table here. I've got uh, something you want to weigh in on some of the issues we've been talking about at 866-55-PRESS. Connect with The Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is The Bill Press Show.
Connect with The Bill Press Show on Twitter. Follow us at BP Show and tweet using the hashtag WatchingBP. This is The Bill Press Show. 12 months before the top of the hour here on this um, <laughs> on this Monday edition of The uh, Bill Press Show. We're just laughing because we're still trying to figure out, get our... Uh, it's hard to get your arms around the fact that Ted Cruz reportedly is traveling to South Africa for the Mel- Nelson Mandela Memorial. You should hear what his father has to say about that. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Carl Frisch is here. He's a friend of Bill, as well as Reed Epstein from uh, from Politico. Um, it is, Reed, interesting that both Ted Cruz and uh, Newt Gingrich have been uh, criticized by their fellow conservatives because they had some nice things to say about Nelson Mandela. Yeah, Ted Cruz uh, has posted what looked to me like a fairly boilerplate uh, salute to Nelson Mandela on his, on face- his Facebook on his page. Facebook page. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I didn't count them all, but countless other members of Congress did the same thing. Uh, and there was sort of a stream of invective about sort of all the in sort of the conservative world all the the horrible things about Nelson Mandela from sort of the mundane to the racist and uh really sort of opened up a vein of uh of society that sort of is can't honor anybody it, it seems like yeah, didn't it did they just say on uh, de mortuis nisi niki bono or something like nico bono in my <laughs> fractured latin if, if you, you, if you don't, can't say anything good about the dead, you yeah. don't say anything at all, right? But, I mean, it's hardly, seems to me, a, 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 a mark of courage to say, have something positive to say about Nelson Mandela. But to, to make the, to set the facts straight, CNN is reporting more than 20 members of the U.S. House, mostly Democrats, and Republican Senator Ted Cruz will travel to South Africa to honor and commemorate former South African president. Well, I saw Mandela. another. I saw Aaron. So he's not backing down. No, Aaron, he's doubling down. Aaron Schock, uh, House Republican from Illinois, from my, uh, we went to high school together. Uh, tweeted a picture this morning of of one of the support planes that he was traveling. He's leading the delegation. Aaron Schock, the House delegation. Yes, he's uh, you know a, a young Republican House member who uh, has been at least trying to present himself as something of a bipartisan figure now part of that was he has ambitions to run for statewide office in illinois well he's but you know picking up where david driver what left off in terms of showing a moderate streak in the republican party um and i think what's interesting um is if you've got ted cruz going out there obviously there's an element of ted cruz trying to you know beef up on his uh you know qualifications from an international relations perspective um, I don't know that a funeral is the way to do that. Um, They're not going to open up the uh, memorial service for a speaking role for Ted Cruz. No, uh, he he might take too long. Um, <laughs> 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 he could speak all the way. He could speak all the way there on the plane. Right. Yeah. He's actually started. Um, but uh, to me, you know, when we talk about the way that the 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 Tea Party base kind of. Rep- responds to these kinds of things. It's emblematic, the the response to Ted Cruz is emblematic of the broader problem that the Republican Party faces these days, which is, if Ted Cruz isn't pure enough uh, for them, who is? Um, And I'm not praising Ted Cruz in the slightest here, um, because he's brought uh, much of this on himself. But um, this is is a a movement that is in um, survival mode. And they're going to lash out at things that stray away from the pack. Reed, you and I cover the White House uh, at the briefings. Um, just about a minute left, but I have to ask you, you mentioned health care before. This is certainly the Mandela um, events around the, the, the celebration of Mandela's life have knocked Obamacare off the front page. Has the White House turned the corner on Obamacare, do you believe? They were doing a little bit better. Uh, you know, the website working is a, an important part that was really sort of the original sin to all of their problems yeah. since the beginning of October. Uh, they still have a lot to prove. Uh, some of the numbers are not going to be good. There, we had a story last week that the number of people who have lost their health insurance because they were their plans were discontinued is probably still going to be higher than the number of people who have signed up for mm. health insurance. And mm. so you're going to have a net increase of people who are uninsured by mm-hmm. the end of the year. Uh, they still have some time to pick that up before the enrollment uh, Yeah. Roman finishes in March, but it's going to be a, uh, a real uphill climb for them. There are a lot of 
not just PR problems, but logistical problems that they still have to have to overcome. Uh, I, but I think Obama, Obamacare is, uh, I, I, it seems to me that there's still some way to go, right? You'll know it's doing better when they start saying Obamacare again. <laughs> That's right. When La- lately, could, they've been saying the Affordable they, Care it's Act. It's been Affordable Care Act, Affordable <laughs> Care Act. When, when the president and Jay Carney start referring to it as Obamacare, you'll know that, that it's in, on the right track. All right. Hey, Reed, thanks so much for coming in. Always good to see you thanks, here. Thanks, Bill. And Carl. You've got a home here anytime. <laughs> Thanks, Friend Bill. of Bill. Okay, Carl Frisch from Bullfight Strategies. I'll be back with a final word, a parting shot, coming up next. This is the Bill Press Show. He changed the world. You can't say that about many people, but you sure can say that about Nelson Mandela, probably the most powerful, most remarkable, most inspirational person of our lifetime. His story is indeed an incredible one, grew from a little black boy with no future in a deeply divided, segregated land, overcome so many obstacles to become a political activist, an attorney, and the leader of his new nation ending apartheid, becoming South Africa's first black president, and inspiring people worldwide with his lifelong fight for freedom. Nelson Mandela may be gone, but his inspiration 
will live always with us. And President Obama and the First Lady on their way to South Africa for that memorial service tomorrow, together with former Presidents Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, and George W. Bush. Have a great Monday, folks. We'll be back here again tomorrow morning, and see this you then. This is the Bill Have- Press Show.